All right, it's time to start. Welcome everyone. Welcome to those of us in the room. Uh, and we have some new members to welcome. So hello. Um, out in Zoom land, hello to you as well. Uh, and if there are new members out there, welcome to you as well. And two guests from other centers who are joining us from across the country and the US, welcome to you as well. I'm Judy Black. I'm one of the directors on our board. And uh, on behalf of the board, I welcome you. Our president is John Nangreaves, and John is somewhere on the call. I know he is. But if you have any questions about the center or some current concerns you would like to raise, or perhaps some suggestions as to what we should be addressing here in our meetings, please contact him. Uh, you can also go to our website, halifax.rasp.ca. There is a list of our board members there, as well as a means to contact some of the key people there in terms of the executive and um, some of the other uh, appointed positions, like our Education Public Outreach uh, Chair, Dave Hoskin, who's here today, and you'll be meeting him in a little while. Also, we have a YouTube channel, so that if for any reason you have to step out of the room today and miss part of the meeting, you can certainly go there in a couple of days and it will be posted on our website. Or if you'd like to go back and review any of our previous meetings, you're certainly welcome to do that as well. The first thing we'd like to do is acknowledge that we are on Indigenous lands, on the Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which Mi'kmaq uh, and Maliseet peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Maliseet title and established the rules for what was an ongoing relationship between the nation. And that is certainly continuing to this day. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Oh, well, magic. Um, the RASC and Halifax Center also believe in and practice inclusivity and diversity. All are welcome regardless of age, disability, gender, gender reassignment, marriage and civil partnership, pregnancy, maternity, race, ethnic origin, color, nationality, national origin, religion or belief, or sex and sexual orientation. We are opposed to all forms of unlawful and unfair discrimination. If for any reason, any one of you, either here in the room or out there in Zoom land, receive any discrimination or harassment from another member, please advise one of our board members because we have zero tolerance for this and we would deal with it. We want to make sure that our members are in a safe environment. So here's today's program. We've certainly done, we have completed the welcome. This will be followed by the photo montage by um, David Hoskin. I know that when we advertised this meeting, we were going to do an awards uh, celebration. However, unforeseen circumstances means we're going to be postponing it until the June 3rd meeting. So stay tuned. They will be announced at that time. Uh, our first speaker up will be Blair McDonald from our own center, and he will be dealing with challenging images of dying stars. And I believe you're giving us some of the science behind the different masses of those various stars. I'll let you explain that a little bit better when we get there. We will have a 15 minute break, okay, in between the two speakers. And then we have Blake Nancaro from London Center. Welcome Blake out there in Zoom land. Um, and he's going to be addressing, look up, the skies are open, get certified. In other words, uh, not get into an institution, but rather Consider your observing certificate and all the different choices you have out there for, for looking up at the night sky. And then David, who is our uh, Education Public Outreach Chair, will be telling us what's up in the May skies. And Pat Kelly, who's our Vice President, will be telling us all sorts of stuff that's new from the board. Okay, so without uh, further ado, I'll hand it over to David. Okay, good. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. All right. Um, so these are uh, images that I've collected off uh, the uh, discussion list and the uh, uh, Halifax RSC uh, Facebook uh, page. Uh, all images taken by center members uh, in the month of April. So uh, next. Ah, so uh, galaxy season. Uh, we're almost at the end of that, uh, but. Uh, Few members took some nice shots. Uh, Jerry Black took this image of the uh, Sombrero Galaxy, uh, Messier uh, 104. Very uh, tricky target, quite small. 
Um, but uh, Jerry did a nice job on this one. There we go. Uh, another galaxy by Jerry, the Needle Galaxy, NGC 4565. Uh, so titled for obvious reasons. And if you have sharp eyes, you can probably see a number of other smaller galaxies uh, in the image as well. So very, very rich field for galaxies. And uh, the last image by Jerry, this was a apocal image of the moon uh, that he uh, took at the Discovery Center when we had our uh, outreach uh, event there uh, at the end of uh, end of April. And uh, you know, a nice shot centered on uh, Copernicus and Plato up in the upper right hand corner. Uh, Michael Buschat, uh, Michael got a new toy, uh, the Tal 2 Newtonian uh, from uh, from Russia, uh, and it's even got a little red star on it. Uh, and uh, this was first light uh, uh, for uh, this particular telescope, Michael, a uh, image of sunspots uh, taken through a uh, solar safety filter. And uh, looks like he's got uh, you know really nice resolution on that. You can clearly see the umbra and an umbra on the uh, largest of those sunspots, as well as some nice uh, granulation. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you might have opened the window for that one. <laughs> uh, another uh, shot from uh, Michael. He lifted this off the uh, um, DGO Observatory uh, All Sky Camera. This is the uh, Bolide, the uh, really brilliant uh, fireball that a number of people saw um, in April on the uh, 22nd. And Dave Chapman uh, was uh, vacationing in Spain and took this image of Venus over Barcelona. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very appropriate. <laughs> and uh, Dave also took uh, this image of the uh, crescent moon and Venus uh, while in Spain. Jason Dane uh, took this image of the Milky Way and uh, zodiacal light uh, all in one. Um, this is the time of year when you can do nice panoramas of the entire uh, Milky Way, uh, which is what Jason has here. And um, if it's showing up, but too well in, in, because of the resolution here. But this cone of light, the zodiacal light, the uh, reflection uh, off uh, dust in, in the uh, plane of the solar system of sunlight. Uh, once it's uh, in this case early morning, so it's uh, no uh, evening rather, um, just after sunset. And if you've got sharp eyes, you can also see uh, the Pleiades there. And have. And uh, another one from Jason, very nice image of Messier 51 and uh, its companion galaxy. Uh, Jason again, uh, took this, uh, this is a, I believe it's a composite shot, um, but it shows Venus uh, in its uh, close approach to the Pleiades uh, in uh, the uh, last month of, of April. And uh, the last shot from Jason is this really nice image of the Aurora Borealis. Uh, he and uh, Simon Dontremont drove to Cape Breton, six hour drive uh, to uh, get some images of the uh, northern lights because uh, I, I gather the, the forecast was for good best skies there. So they went on a road trip. Uh, not the only one we have though. Uh, you didn't have to go to Cape Breton. Uh, Paul Evans took this uh, picture at Lawrence Town Beach. So lots of nice aurora activity. Uh, Melody and Bruce Hamilton uh, had some nice uh, views from Litchfield as well. So probably closer to go to Litchfield than to go to Cape Breton. And Nancy Hughes uh, took this image of the aurora. Um, not sure where Nancy lives. I think it's somewhere around the South Shore. The, this particular aurora was was pretty incredible. It was a G4 uh, solar class uh, geomagnetic storm. 
And I saw pictures of uh, Aurora taken as far south as Texas, uh, posted online. Um, not that long. Uh, you could see the green naked eye. Uh, you need the longer exposure to get the reds and the blues. Um, I think Nancy took this with her cell phone. So, yeah, so it couldn't have been that long. Jerry? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I took this image of the uh, sun in April uh, through a hydrogen alpha uh, filter on the solar telescope. And uh, I like this one because of that uh, particular um, prominence at the top. Uh, it, uh, it's large. <laughs> it extends uh, far, far out from the sun. And sunspots with a white light filter on the 28th of April. A waxing gibbous moon earlier on in April. Uh, gibbous mercury. Um, my second attempt to uh, get a shot of mercury. Uh, fuzzy, but it's there. <laughs> and, and showing about the right phase. It's tricky because it's so close to the horizon, you get a lot of chromatic aberration. But a hard, hard time. Uh, um, getting the, the right color blend. And uh, as a challenge, uh, I, I read uh, just by chance that there was a supernova in the surfboard galaxy, Messier 108, and uh, it was discovered in, I think, middle of March. And it had, uh, I took this image in the middle of April, so it had faded quite a bit. Uh, but I was still able, by enlarging the appropriate section, to uh, see the supernova there. Uh, you see it's reddish because of the, uh, the effect of the uh, dust uh, clouds in, in that galaxy. Um, Bruce took this uh, image of Messier. There we are. And uh, Needle Galaxy. NGC 46, uh, 4565. This is a popular target. Okay, I did it. Um, Kathy Walker uh, took this picture of uh, Abel 28, which is a planetary nebula. Kathy's been going after uh, some of the, the smaller, uh, less well known targets. That's nice pictures. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, again, Kathy Walker, a small galaxy, uh, NGC uh, 5005 in Canis uh, Venatus C. Next one, please. Um, this is a, a globular cluster, NGC 5466. It's quite a, a dispersed globular cluster. Uh, you could mistake it for, an, for a concentrated open cluster. It's in Bootes. Uh, and it has uh, the uh, distinction of being uh, one of the oldest known uh, globular star clusters. Next one. And uh, lastly, this is uh, Sharpless uh, 2124 uh, uh, in Cygnus. Um, this is an image that uh, I think Kathy um, gathered the data uh, some time ago, but reprocessed it and was able to bring out a lot of uh, nice uh, nebulosity uh, hydrogen and uh, alpha uh, uh, lighting uh, around the uh, the nebula itself and i believe that's the end Lou whitehorn who's our national pre national or sorry our uh, honorary president uh, wants to say a couple of words and when you're honorary president you have the right to interrupt proceedings at any time um not written down but that's kind of the accept accepted so i'm just going to Hello, Mary Lou. Hi, Judy. You're on. Am I on? You're on. I'm still seeing these beautiful photos. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt. I don't like to do this. Um, but a bit earlier, there was a brief flurry of communications, and I had a, a quick call from National President Charles Ennis, who's in juggling oranges and off somewhere to some crisis. Um, and he asked me to relay a message from himself to the Halifax Center. Uh, it's a short video, one minute, I believe. Um, and I think Dave Lane has the video 
and has it queued up and ready to go. Am I right, Dave? Yes, that's right. Okay, we'll we'll press press the play button. Hello, Halifax, yeah. Senator. I'm Charles Dennis, the national president. And I wish I could be there because I have fond memories an of an amazing bunch of astronomers that I visited back at the Halifax GA, <laughs> or even be there in Zoom. But my daughter bought her first house, and I'm helping her move today. You know how it is. So this message is for Judy Black, who has been working tirelessly for some time now and on the phone with me all hours of the day, just about every day, working on bringing the board and the National Council together to work as a team working on cooperation and communication and transparency and doing an absolutely fabulous job. And this is going to ensure that we thrive and prosper going forward into the next few decades. And so the board has approved my nomination to award you the President's Award for 2023. Congratulations. <laughs> you deserve it. Please stop. Thank you. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> I don't know what to say. I just have um, a Phoenix. Um, Congratulations, Judy. Thank you, Mary Lou. Uh, sorry, guys and gals. I'm flabbergasted here. I don't know what to say. Um, other than to the to the president, thank you. Um, and um, it's it's been an interesting year to say the least. Um, there's been a lot of change, as all of you can appreciate, uh, at the national level and with the national council. And it's as exasperating as it has been at times and frustrating. It has been extremely rewarding knowing that things are moving forward and that our society will continue and thrive. So. Um, that's what I work towards, and I think all of us are working towards as, as the team of RASC, so that's what we all will continue into the coming year. Uh, so thank you all. Um, and on that note, I think we'll get moving with our own agenda. Um, our first speaker is Blair McDonald. I'm sure many of you in the center have known Blair for many years. He's been a member for 25, I believe. Thereabouts, that's what it says here for over 25, actually. Okay, 30 years. <laughs> okay. Um, and he's been interested in, and as you all know, he's been interested in talking about uh, astronomy and astro imaging and processing. And I went back through um, some of our old videos just to see how many times he has, and has presented on various aspects of astro imaging. And it's Blair, it's it's more than just three. This is not, this may be the fourth in the series that you're presenting, but you have done numerous presentations to our center in this capacity. And so the fourth in this series of the Astrophotographer Skies uh, is entitled Challenging Images of Dying Stars. And he'll use some challenging images of stellar remnants, explain how stars of different masses die. And it includes a little of the science, no mafo. <laughs> Maybe not, <laughs> along with lots of details about the images and how they were taken. So without further ado, I'll hand the floor to Blair. As Judy said, this is the fourth in the uh, Astrophotographer's Skies series that uh, I have been working on for a couple of years now. The idea behind this presentation, uh, Dave, can I get you to dose the light there? That screen is bad enough at most times, but there we go. So the idea behind this presentation is that uh, I'm going to use some images that I've taken uh, to help explain how various stars of various types die. Now, stars are a little like a living being. They form out of large clouds of gas and dust, as you saw from some of the pictures that were uh, up on the screen there before the presentation. And uh, they live a very long time. Uh, and uh, given Judy was going back trying to find out how long I've been a member, you know, I know the feeling. Uh, um, <clears throat> but at any rate, uh, eventually all good things come to an end and a star does, we'll say, die. Um, it runs out of fuel and uh, the star is no more at that point. So, as I said, stars don't live forever. And a star's fate is determined by its mass. So large stars... Everyone that uh, hasn't uh, read uh, too much into astronomy will think, well, gee, they should last longer. 
Turns out they don't. Um, Lomas stars live a very long time. And some of the low mass stars, some red dwarfs that are out there right now, they have life expectancies longer than the present age of the universe. That's not to say they've been around since the beginning, but they will be around for a very long time. Um, higher mass stars burn through their fuel very quickly. And quickly here is a relative term. We're talking millions of years. But they do not last as long as these little small red dwarfs which are, in human terms, they'll last forever. Um, <clears throat> large stars tend to consume their fuel fairly quickly, and uh, as you'll see in some of the pictures, can go out in a blaze of glory. So, give you an idea of what I'm talking about when I say low to medium mass stars. We're talking stars that are usually red to yellow in color. There are some blue ones, but for the most part, they're usually red to yellow mostly because they're smaller and they don't get quite as hot as the large giant stars. They fuse hydrogen in their core at a relatively sedate rate. Now, because of that, they last a fairly long time. The balance between gravity and the force pushing out from the fusion going on at the core causes the star's diameter or to equalize at about solar diameters a little smaller, a little larger, but in that neighborhood. Um, and finally, their main sequence stars. They range from small red dwarfs to a little larger than our sun. And despite what uh, I used to think when I was uh, a kid and first looked at uh, a Hertzberg-Russell diagram, stars do not move along that nifty little line. They're at one spot, they live their life there, and then they move off the line. So they don't move up and down that line. So let's take a look then at how some of these low mass stars die. Uh, I'm assuming the camera is there, so I'm in the frame, hopefully. Uh, so these lower mass stars, when they, excuse me, run out of fuel, now, when I say run out of fuel, they run out of hydrogen at the core. They then start to contract. And as they contract, they get hotter. The pressure increases to the point where, in some cases, they can actually fuse helium at the core. And they fuse helium into carbon and sometimes a little oxygen. Um, turns out through a uh, nifty little, uh, as uh, someone described it to me once upon a time, flaw in physics, you don't get beryllium out of a star, which would be two helium atoms fused together, simply because it doesn't produce enough energy to be self-sustaining. So it turns out that uh, due to a little quirk in physics, the uh, amount of energy required to produce carbon, 12, if I remember right, is roughly the same as beryllium-8, so the star produces carbon. And good thing for us, because if it produced beryllium, the star would stop at that point, and there wouldn't be anything else. Now. As the star begins to fuse helium, it can also fuse some hydrogen in a shell around the core, and the star tends to puff out and get larger again. So now the star is getting large, and you can have several cycles of this where the star gets larger and then contracts and gets larger again. And as it does that, it puffs its outer envelopes off as a planetary nebula. And we'll take a look at a couple of uh, pictures of planetary nebula here in a bit. Now, the interesting thing that happens at this point, the core collapses. There's no more fusion going on at the core. Gravity wins and the core starts to collapse. It turns out though that uh, there's something that can save the star and it's called electron degeneracy pressure. And what happens is as the core collapses, you squish electrons into an ever denser area in the core and they take up all the available energy states. Once that happens, they begin to exert an outward pressure to prevent any more electrons from coming in. As a result, it can actually support stars roughly the mass of the sun, and you get what's called a white dwarf. So, oops, okay, let's try that again. There we go. So, finally, when the nebula dissipates and puffs away into uh, the interstellar medium, what's left behind is this core of the star, a white dwarf at that point. 
Now, these things are incredibly dense. Um, my wife keeps saying they're slightly less dense than I am, but we won't go there. Um, <clears throat> Judy, you don't have to agree. <laughs> uh, these stellar remnants have densities in the neighborhood of hundreds of tons per cubic centimeter. So think you have a teaspoon of one of these things and it weighs hundreds of tons. So that gives you an idea of just how dense the cores of these stars are. Uh, and they have radii of a few thousand kilometers. So now you have a star, roughly the mass of the sun, that has been squished down from, what's the sun, Dave? A little over a million kilometers wide to a couple of thousand kilometers wide. So there's a lot of material squished into these white dwarfs, and they have quite the gravitational field. So to give you an idea of what some of these things look like, we have a couple of images coming up. And I'm going to ask people in the audience, if they have a question at any point, just put your hand up and ask it. Uh, there will be a Q&A session at the end, assuming there's any questions, but uh, feel free to just ask away. Same for the folks online. Uh, Bob, do you get the questions directly from the folks online? Just stick your hand up when one comes in. Uh, sometimes there'll be questions about the images, which is why I uh, mentioned that. So the first thing we're gonna look at and uh, hopefully this shows up okay back there, is uh, M27. M27 is known as the Dumbbell Nebula. Uh, I keep thinking it should be called the Apple Core Nebula, but at any rate. Um, this shot was taken with, as you can see in the uh, details there, with a Canon 60DA. And getting a picture of the Dumbbell Nebula is not particularly a challenge. It's one of the things that many beginners will first target and try and shoot. Um, and I know we have some imagers in the audience, and they will probably attest to the fact that getting the core of the nebula is not that hard. Getting that outer envelope, I see Dave shaking his head already, <laughs> is a bit of a challenge. And that's a challenge that's made easier nowadays by modern equipment. So things like the Optolong L Enhanced Light Pollution Filter, there's a whole variety of them. Jerry, you have a Triad is the name of it? Triad, sorry. Um, they're, they're narrow band interference filters that pass multiple narrow bands. So you get HA, you get uh, hydrogen beta, and you get O3, all out of one filter, which is really convenient for those of us that do uh, full color imaging. Um, and it really makes it possible to get the odor envelope in that nebula without hours and hours and hours of exposure. Uh, if I remember correctly, this was a little over two hours. Uh, it says there are two hours and 20 minutes of total exposure at ISO 800 from relatively dark skies. That was taken at our cottage. Um, our cottage is on the Myra River, and the skies are very similar to St. Croix's uh, for those that are uh, interested in what uh, the skies look like out there. Um, but, you know, Reasonably dark skies, but not the darkest in the world, and you're still able to get images like that. Um, this is a shot of the Ring Nebula, and this one was a little different for me. Normally, I shoot at 800 millimeters or 850, which is the uh, prime focus focal length of my telescope. This one, I used a Barlow, and what I wanted to do is I wanted to get some of the detail in the core of the nebula here. Um, I don't get that at my native focal length. So we had to, uh, had a friend over that night and we stuck a Barlow in and uh, imaged that target. Um, that image has a lot of processing done to it. Uh, surprisingly enough, not to sharpen the image up, but to get the stars proper. Uh, the reason for that is it was quite low when I shot that and I shot it at a very long focal length. So each one of those stars was actually three stars, a red one, a blue one, and a green one the atmospheric dispersion had separated them enough that I had three individual stars. Uh, you can imagine what the nebula looked like. It was just smeared as well. So fortunately, I have a piece of software called Registar that will distort the image and line all those back up. And it does the same thing for the nebula and uh, you get a reasonably detailed image. So that'll give you an idea of how that one came into being. Now, the next shot, if I remember correctly, yep. Uh, is uh, an actual white dwarf. So it's not the nebulae or nebulae in the areas of these things, but uh, 
Now we took a look at this already. The, the, the white dwarf here in this case is the star right in the center. Uh, and a lot of the other stars in the image are suppressed by the filter. So that's why there's not too many stars in this image. Um, so here's a, an image I took from my driveway. And this image was uh, one of Sirius, the uh, brightest star in, uh, excuse me, Candace Major. And part of the challenge in this image, aside from getting that star, was identifying which one it was. Uh, even the RASC challenge site on the national website has the wrong star marked as Sirius B. Uh, almost everybody picks this star. Uh, that star is too far away. Uh, what I ended up doing was I ended up taking uh, multiple stars, multiple double stars that had uh, a star approximately the same distance away in angular separation. And uh, so I was able to figure out on my frame exactly where that star should be and uh, ended up with uh, my first image of Sirius B. Now, that's kind of an interesting image when you look at it because they're well separated. It's not that hard to see two stars or image two stars that are separated by, I think it's roughly 10 arc seconds, if I remember right. Uh, the problem is the difference in brightness between Sirius A and Sirius B. Sirius A is the brightest star in our sky. It's up in the winter. And the brightness difference between those two stars is almost 10 magnitudes, which is a difference of 10,000. So to give you an idea, that shot was taken with my Canon 60DA, which has a 14-bit analog to digital converter, which means at best it can see differences in brightness of one over to the 14th, 16,000 roughly. Um, yeah, 16384. Yep. So at any rate, basically what that amounts to is in a single frame, this star only differs by one count. As anyone who's done any imaging knows, there's more noise in that image than one count. So the only way that image came about was through averaging lots of frames. So we averaged in this case 100 or 12 seconds of 0.1 second images. So it was 120 images. Every time you double the number of frames that are in your stack, you pick up about half a bit of resolution. So I got an extra three and a bit bits out of that stack and that allowed me to pick that star out. And even then it would have been hard to pick out if I didn't know where it was. Once I found it, however, then it was relatively straightforward to process it and make it brighter than it would normally appear. Uh, normally that would be so dim, it would be hard to pick it out from the background glow. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. That was, all these images were taken with my refractor. Yeah, um, that would be a very tricky target with a reflector. Uh, the diffraction spikes would cause you a great deal of grief. Um, I think it was Dave Chapman that put me on to the idea that with a reflector, you can use a hexagonal mask, is it, Dave? Uh, so if you're doing visual work and you're using a reflector, think about using a hexagonal mask and it gives you diffraction spikes, but you can line, you can rotate it and line it up so that the stars fall in between spikes and you can make that star pop out a little better. Fair, fair enough. We'll, we'll give, we'll give the mic, another microphone here. I forgot about that, him being on him being unavailable to be heard online. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Um, want to repeat so I that, have Dave. actually visually observed Sirius B in someone else's reflecting telescope. And he did use a hexagonal mask. What that does is it, it instead of the typical diffraction pattern you see uh, from a Newtonian reflector, it creates, uh, I guess, six really strong diffraction spikes in specific directions, but in between the diffraction spikes, there's a kind of a uh, an empty area, so, so the, the diffraction is less, and if you orient the mask in the right direction, you pick out Sirius B relative to Sirius A. Um, I don't know if that would help with the astro imaging as well, but... Uh, it, it might in a reflector. Uh, with a refractor, probably not. But, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, okay, I can see that. Good. Yeah, we have a question online there, Bob? Yeah, a couple of them. 
Um, let me just go back up here. Hang on. The first one uh, was, uh, what's the rough timeline for white dwarves? How long they last or slowly burn out? Um, once you get a white dwarf, it will last effectively forever because it's no longer a star fusing hydrogen. It's just a ball of, if I remember correctly, carbon. Um, and uh, it's sitting there in a degenerate state, meaning that it's supported by electron degeneracy pressure. And it will remain like that pretty much forever unless it's in orbit around another star. If it's in orbit around another star, what will happen is the orbit will eventually begin to decay. The star will get close enough to start actually sucking material off its companion. And uh, at that point, if it sucks enough material off, what it will do is undergo a supernova explosion. Uh, but uh, a, a sole white dwarf sitting out there by itself will last pretty much forever. Also, uh, a comment from uh, Blake, I believe. Uh, he indicated that he uses a square mask instead of a hexagonal That would probably mask. work equally as well as the hexagonal mask. Uh, the, the idea is that if you should have put a slide up for this. If you have a Newtonian reflector type telescope, or even a Schmidt pass that's got a fairly large secondary obstruction, it does, in the case of the Newtonian, two things. The spider veins that support the mirror cause uh, crossed diffraction spikes, but the secondary mirror smears the light around the central area out a bit. So the star, uh, in this case, uh, the bright star Sirius would actually smear out over that whole area. Um, and uh, by using a mask, you can rotate it and it transfers some of that smear from the central area to the diffraction spikes and it makes these dimmer stars visible. So I suspect a square one would work maybe not quite as well as the hexagonal one because it's got more diffraction spikes that it can transfer some of that light out to. But anyway, uh, any others? Um, you know, if someone asked how long they last, they last effectively forever, but they get cooler and cooler and cooler. And we've just got a time frame of 4 billion years to cool off. Takes a while. No, it wasn't. Um, it was a little bit of detective work to find it. Uh, it was the subject of a previous presentation. Um, any other questions before we move on? Yeah, go ahead, Dave. It, it's hot and yeah, as far as I know, it's hot and cooling down. Um, there could be a little bit of fusion going on in a shell, as an example, but I suspect by the time it looks like that, that's long since gone. Thanks. Okay. So next on the list, we've looked at white dwarves. Well, if the star is bigger than the stars that produce white dwarfs, about 1.4 solar masses in the core that's left over. Now, the star could have been much bigger, but the core, after it's done fusing everything, is at about 1.4 solar masses. Then, at that point, electron, well, uh, electron degeneracy pressure, say that five times fast, cannot support the star anymore, and it continues to collapse. Fortunately, there is one other force that can save it and it's neutron degeneracy pressure. So as you can picture what happens, the electrons squish down into the protons and it squishes them together, forms neutrons. And now you have a big ball of neutrons and the neutrons then occupy all the energy levels that are available. And to put more neutrons in there, they push outward, they create an outward force that resists collapse any further. That works to about two solar masses. So at that point, up to two solar masses, neutron degeneracy pressure can save that star. It won't be a star anymore. It will be what we call a neutron star. And the resulting neutron star has just ridiculous densities. So remember, a white dwarf was 100, hundreds of tons per cubic centimeter. Neutron star is millions of tons per cubic centimeter. And they have a radius of approximately tens of kilometers. So think the sun 
million kilometers in size, squished down to 10, 20 kilometers. You've got all that mass in a very, very little area, and it makes for some very strange physics. Uh, we get pulsars from these devices, so uh, devices from these objects. So if you've got a neutron star that happens to be spinning, and most stars tend to spin at fairly sedate rates. I mean, what's the sun spin at? Once a month, if I remember right, something like that. So as that collapses, just like a figure skater, it speeds up. So you get a star that might have been spinning once a month, maybe even slower, is now spinning once every couple of milliseconds. It can actually get to the point where the surface of the neutron star is approaching the speed of light. You get stars like that with a magnetic field and they generate radio waves and they get focused in jets. And as those jets, as you can picture the star is spinning, it might be wobbling as well. And if that jet happens to pass by the earth, we detect a radio pulse. And if the star is spinning quickly, we detect pulses very quickly. And that becomes what we call a pulsar. Uh, if the orientation of the star is such that the jet is not pointed at the earth, it could still be a pulsar. We just never know it because we wouldn't see those jets combine. And these things are created in supernova explosions for the most part. So what you get, you get a huge star, it's contracting, it gets to the point where it actually comes down, forms iron, contracts further, forms a neutron star, and it bounces a little bit. And that bounce blows away the rest of the star. It literally blows it out into space and it makes an explosion so bright that it can be seen in the daytime. Now, I know I will get the dates wrong on this one because I didn't write them in my notes. <laughs> but to give you an idea, here is M1, the Crab Nebula. And it is a supernova remnant, although you can't see it. Right in this area is a little tiny star spinning very quickly, and its magnetic field and radio output is ionizing the gas that's been blown away from the star and giving it this characteristic red filamentary shape. Um, as I said, I know I'll get the dates wrong. 1057 is, what's that? Somewhere around there, uh, this star blew up. And the Christian world ignored it entirely because at that time the Inquisition was going on. The church said that the uh, heavens are unchanging and no one was going to argue. But it was recorded by both Islamic and Chinese astronomers. You could see this thing in the daytime, which somewhat made me wonder how you think we have problems with uh, suppressing the press today. You could look up and see it and nobody mentioned it. <laughs> But uh, at any rate, uh, that'll give you an idea of what these things look like after they go boom. So now all the material is flying away from that star uh, at huge speed. It can be some of the neatest looking things uh, that you can see in the sky. Uh, this one is visible. It's, I guess, officially it's in Gemini, isn't it, Dave? Uh, just above Orion. Yeah, I guess it's in Taurus. Yeah, you're right. So at any rate, this one you can actually see, you can find it in the city, but this particular shot was taken and it took about two hours of 15 minute exposures using a zoo camera. Uh, this particular camera is a, uh, uh, an APS-C size chip, so it's like a DSLR size chip. Uh, and uh, I used an Optolong Allen Hans filter. It was taken from my driveway and that was the challenge in getting this image. Now, for those of you that haven't visited my house when I've been imaging, uh, this is my driveway. Okay. I image from right here. Uh, this is not a shot taken at dusk. This is a shot taken in October at about 11 p.m. The glow you see in the north, not the west, is Sackville, not sunset. Yeah, that's right. Judy had her street light or had her porch light on that night. Uh, so that gives you an idea of what I'm getting some of these images through, the ones that were taken from the city. So you can picture the challenge of, uh, especially that night since it was cloudy, <laughs> but you can picture the challenge of trying to haul out some of these dim objects from those kinds of conditions. Any questions there yet? Yes. Yes. 
Oh, uh, yep. I was asked if we can filter out all of that light pollution and get uh, that shot. And the end, what's that? With a single filter. The answer to that is yes. Uh, and we'll get into why a little later. I've got a couple of slides that show what that filter is uh, all about. But that'll give you an idea of what my street looks like. Um, I keep threatening to, you know, take a pellet gun to that light one of these days. Um, they, it used to be almost reasonable to image from my yard. You could look up when we first moved in there and uh, pretend you could see the Milky Way. You can't even pretend anymore. Um, but what I used to be able to do with that street light back when it was uh, low pressure sodium, I believe. Not the red ones, high pressure sodium. Uh, a high pressure sodium light. I used to go up in my bedroom window up here and take a green laser pointer and shine it at the uh, light sensor on top of the light and it would go out for 15 minutes. <laughs> That's right. The problem now, of course, is there is no light sensor at the top of that light. It actually, believe it or not, uses GPS uh, and it's calculated on the light. So they know where the light is. They know when the sun goes down at that time of year and the light turns on like half an hour afterward. And uh, so it's a bit of a pain in the butt now. I suppose I could go up there with a garbage bag, but uh, that might annoy the neighbors. <laughs> so at any rate, that's, that's where I do all my urban imaging from for those that are uh, interested. A red garbage bag? Yeah, it still ruins the camera though. A black garbage bag. It's about 30 layers of it. <laughs> um, here's another image taken from that same spot. And it is an image of CTB1 uh, or ABLE 85, I keep wanting to say 65. Um, it was taken from my driveway and it was taken because, well, be quite blunt, because I'm an idiot. Someone told me, you'll never get that shot. That's like waving a red flag to a bull, right? So five hours later, um, I managed to get that shot. And it's actually included in the uh, ABLE catalog that uh, Kathy, I think it was, is going through and taking photos of all of the objects. This was originally thought to be a planetary nebula, uh, or nebula rather, and it's now known to be a supernova remnant. So uh, it's about the size of the full moon and very dim. Um, it's probably one of the hardest targets I've ever imaged. Uh, it would be easier to image from St. Croix, but that was taken in the middle of a pandemic walked down and I couldn't get up to St. Croix. Uh, so at any rate, it's five hours, again, using that Optolong l Hans filter and about 20 hours of processing. So it takes quite a bit to pull detail uh, like this oxygen three edge on that target. Uh, getting that out of there was uh, a little bit of uh, tedious work with masks and a few other things. Probably could have, yes. Um, pr probably could have downloaded that picture from someone else's website and won my bet, but I was determined to do it legally. Um, hey, I won a bag of Oreos out of it. What can I say? Um, <clears throat> so at any rate, black holes. So once a star is denser, or denser, sorry, is the, once the core has more mass than about two solar masses, Newton degeneracy pressure can no longer save the star. It, what's that? <laughs> Dave is trying to say it five times fast. Uh, coming up, sort of. Uh, at any rate, <clears throat> so if the stellar remnant is more massive than about two solar masses, we don't know of a force that can stop the collapse. Be quite blunt about it. That's not to say there isn't one, we just don't know about it. So the core collapses, it keeps on collapsing. It collapses into a singularity. Cut off from the rest of the universe by its event horizon. Okay, for those that aren't familiar with it, the event horizon is where the escape velocity of that star is the speed of light. Since nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, nothing closer than the event horizon can ever come out. So it's cut off from us and the rest of the universe by this event horizon. And it was predicted by general relativity. Remember that question about math? 
Um, here we are. Nice, simple equ equation for general relativity. Until you expand it all, add in all the incomprehensibility quotients, and solve for something not even in the original equation. Then you get this. Simple, huh? Any rate, um, that's my one slide of math. It has nothing to do with the rest of the presentation, but you need comic relief at some point, right? Uh, <clears throat> so here's another image taken from my cottage. And as Dave said, it's sort of an image of a black hole. No, it's not the Tulip Nebula. It's that too, but um, this is where I need a pointer. But at any rate, for those that are uh, in the audience, everybody see this star? Okay, that star has orbiting around it a black hole known as Cygnus X1. And this was a shot I took at the cottage. I was not attempting to image a black hole until, of course, I found it was there. Um, I was trying to get a nice shot of the Tulip Nebula. But I noticed not on this shot, on the original shot that is not nearly this stretched, so I get a nice view of the Tulip Nebula. Can everybody see this structure right here? Does it show up on the screen there? That is actually a bow shock from the jet coming off the black hole as it slams into the interstellar medium and gets pulled back by the solar wind from this star. The rest of the jet going in the other direction, you can just make out it sort of goes up that way and eventually curls over. So that's my picture of a black hole, or at least the effects of a black hole on the local environment. Um, <clears throat> didn't require a telescope the size of the Earth at any rate. But uh, so that'll give you an idea of what you can get with a small telescope after you've sat down and scratched your head a bit and tried to figure out how to take very faint detail that's in the image. And the way I usually find those <clears throat> is. Uh, after I browse the web and find out that Cygnus X1 is actually in that frame, you take that and do, uh, for those that are familiar with image processing, a ridiculous histogram stretch. Everything else just gets obliterated, it all saturates, but you see these funny little shapes. And then once you find out where they are, you can bring them out knowing they're there. The catch is to prevent everything else from washing out while you're doing it. So that'll give you an idea of what you can capture with just a small telescope. Um, so this was two hours from cottage skies, some Meg four skies, similar to St. Croix. And uh, over 30 hours of processing to get the brightness balance right. Um, I actually ended up processing the image twice. Once for the Tulip Nebula and the background nebulosity, and once for the uh, uh, bow shock and jets. And then I had to combine those two images. I couldn't get a stretch and a mask that would let me get everything all at once. So I actually had to combine the two shots at it. Uh, no, I do mean make four. Uh, no, I don't. You're correct. You are absolutely correct. Portal four. Yeah, I wish it was. Uh... <laughs> uh, at any rate, a couple of closing notes before we get to the last two slides. Dying stars make our world. So all the elements heavier than lithium were made in stars. They didn't form with the Big Bang. They formed afterward, courtesy of stars fusing material. Um, all the elements that make up the Earth and us were made in the cores of stars. So all the carbon, the oxygen, the nitrogen, and everything else that makes us and this wonderful planet up came from a star. The next time you're out there contemplating your existence, look up and thank a star. So one last image here. Most people will recognize that as the Crescent Nebula. Um, but getting the Crescent Nebula wasn't that challenging. But getting this little guy called the Soap Bubble Nebula that was a lot more challenging. And the Soap Bubble Nebula is such a challenge to image that the first image of it that was recognized as a planetary nebula was taken in 2007 by an amateur. He used a 150 millimeter astrophysics refractor uh, to take an image, found it, 
and it was later verified that it was an undiscovered planetary nebula. It's so dim, and it's in all this bright gas and dust that you just can't see it. If you take an unfiltered image, and I've got several of them, I've never been able to find it. That showed up immediately with the filter. So when you start looking at some of these images, the filter that I use is the reason I can get them. So someone asked about that filter there earlier. Um, here's the camera I've been using lately. Excuse me. Uh, it's uh, a CMOS camera, a very low, low noise CMOS camera from Zoo. Uh, and uh, here's the response of the filter. So think of this as all the interesting lines of both light pollution and astronomical targets. The filter has a very narrow band pass around hydrogen alpha here, around O3 and hydrogen beta. So you've got red, green, and blue. Um, those three are passed through to my one-shot color camera. And all the other lines that we think of as light pollution get wiped out. And the filter does an excellent job at removing those. So as a result, the targets that you image with this are usually emission nebulae of some sort, whether they're planetaries, uh, nebula like uh, the Orion Nebula, or supernova remnants. They emit in one of these or multiple of those three bands that are passed by the filter. So the filter lets those through, blocks everything else out, and you can get targets that are very faint. I even use the filter when I'm imaging these types of targets from very dark skies because it just increases the um, contrast so much, pulls these targets out. It's not so useful on galaxies, which are fairly broadband source. Um, you can photograph a galaxy. It looks very weird uh, when you do. Most of the light is wiped out and the galaxy looks fairly dim, except for a couple of areas that happen to be uh, uh, hydrogen alpha emission areas in that galaxy, they pop right out. Question, Blair. Uh, so I gather you get nothing out of the blue, blue channel, or just nothing there. No, I get blue. But the the, the band the, the band pass doesn't let any blue light through. Yes, it does. Uh, one second. Well, or green. I mean, it's got or uh, well. I guess it. Here's H beta, which is blue. What you're not showing is what the red, green, and blue filters native to the camera, what their responses if, if you are. If you look at this area in the camera, there's lots of blue and green sensitivity. They cross over at that area. Sort of cross over. That's correct. Yeah. So you, you do get lots of blue. Um, I have had very few images, not zero images, but very few, where the fact that you're near the crossover of the uh, uh, color filter array on the chip causes a problem. And in those, I've actually had to subtract one channel from the other to get the little excess and use that as a mask to enhance the blue. But for the most part, uh, you get enough blue through that you can pull it out of the image. For us old timers, that's basically uh, a UHC and an, H, uh, and an H alpha filter. Uh, uh, effectively, it is, but the bandwidths are much narrower. Doesn't look that. You mean the that, the bandwidth of a of an of a an O3 a bandwidth of a of a UHC filter would be wider than that. A little well, a little know. bit. Yeah, they only generally incorporate encompass the H beta and the O3. Yeah, they they tend to come they tend to come flat out further and then drop off down around this area. Um, that loses a little of the uh, H beta, but not too much. Um, I mean, it's not, it's not as good for narrow band imaging as true single, uh, single um, wavelength narrow band filters would be, uh, but it does a pretty good job. And I'm lazy, so I don't like to sit down and shoot through three separate filters if I can avoid it. Um, that's pretty much it uh, for the presentation. This is what the gear looks like. It's set up. Uh, I finally come up with a name for it. It's been called the Driveways End Observatory. Um, it is portable, so whether it's the cottage driveway or my driveway at home, uh, you can see the camera is here. Um, the filter is actually in this section of the extension tube. It screws in place. 
and it's uh, a Skywatcher Esprit 120 APO with a guide scope on top, all sitting on a Celestron. Uh, and that's sort of how I end up spending my summer, uh, losing sleep and having that up all night long imaging. Yeah, go ahead, Jerry. What is the uh, focal length of that guide scope? That guide scope's focal length is 400 millimeters. So it's about half the length of the uh, imaging platform. Go ahead, Dave. Um, that one is a CGXL, a little lighter than the uh, CGE Pro that Dave helped me carry once. Only once. Go ahead, Dave. This is a little off the wall, but I'm going to ask it. So in 1969, Joni Mitchell wrote a song. She was supposed to go to the Woodstock Festival. She couldn't get there because of the traffic jam. So she stayed in her hotel room and wrote a song called Woodstock. And one of the lines of the chorus, she wrote, we are stardust. So my question for you is, what did Joni Mitchell know about astrophysics? A fair amount, apparently. Um, that's that's a little like uh, the church uh, in the U.S. that every year on the date uh, celebrate celebrating memorializing the Edmund Fitzgerald, uh, as people hopefully know, there were 29 people perished in that, and they uh, ring the church bells 29 times. This year they rang them 30 for Gordon Lightfoot. But anyway, um, I know because I don't know the answer. <laughs> Any other questions? Bob, you had a question for someone there? No? Okay. All done? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Blair. Um, the next step in, in our agenda is a 15 minute break. So go grab a tea, a coffee, or those of you out in Zoom listening who want something stronger, do so. Uh, otherwise, uh, the rest of us will enjoy 15 minutes here in the room, and then we'll get back at um, 2.25. And we're going to leave yeah. the uh, the Zoom open, but we'll uh, turn off the recording. So the folks, uh, and probably turn down the, the uh, speaker here. So online, if you guys want to have a little chat about whatever, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, Judy? Judy, Judy. Guess I've been cut off. Hi, Judy. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. That's because can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Dave. Okay, well, uh, Judy shouldn't have used the the microphone that has the flaky connector. That's right, I can't read Flaky Connector. I'm here. Thank you for picking up the right um, equipment, Judy. I just, I think uh, Charles's announcement put you in a state of shock and you immediately rushed off into um, the meeting. And I, I just wanted to say that um, during your whole tenure as president and your involvement in so many things in the RESC that you have shown extraordinary leadership and extraordinary diplomacy in very sticky situations. And the RESC is so fortunate to have had you as an asset at this particular time. And I can't think of anybody who more deserves the President's Award this year, um, particularly in light of your contributions in the last year or so. And the Halifax Center has benefited enormously but the entire society across the country has benefited enormously from your contributions. So I wanna thank you twice. I wanna thank you for doing all that hard work. And I wanna thank you for listening in when I tried to nudge you into a leadership position. I'm really glad I did. So thanks again. Thanks, Mary Lou. Uh, her last comment there, I do blame Mary Lou for me being involved on the board because uh, actually I was secretary on the board and at Nova East one year, 
she suggested you should be president. You should run for president. <laughs> um, and so I thought about it over the summer, because um, that, that particular year that the Nova East was earlier in the summer. And I decided, what the heck, I may as well. And the rest of say is history. Um, but uh, it, it um, the rask has given me many things. One, it's given me a, a reason to look up at the sky and actually know what I'm looking at. But more importantly, it's introduced me to a whole incredible group of people from across the country, not just here in the center. Um, I'm very thankful for the people here in the center who have mentored me from my get-go uh, back in October of 2013, if you remember. Um, and it doesn't feel that long, uh, some days. <laughs> um, but I've learned a lot from all of you. So I'm really grateful for that. Thank you. Uh, Blair's comment was that Jerry gets credit for the patient's training. <laughs> Goes two ways, Blair. <laughs> okay. We'll get back to uh, the meeting. Hello, back there in, in Zoom land. Hopefully, you're, you're all back from uh, grabbing your, your beverage or whatever. So, welcome back, everyone. Uh, the next part of our program, uh, we have a speaker from OA, as they say, uh, Blake Nancaro from London Center. Some of you in the room and in Zoom land have known Blake for years as the observing chair um, at RASC. He's very well known and very well respected because of his work in developing observing programs for our society. Uh, he has taught, apparently, according to uh, what he gave me to introduce him with, he taught himself astronomy, acquired his first telescope in 1990, which isn't that long ago, and joined the RASC in 2007 as an experiment. He operated the 74-inch telescope at the David Dunlop Observatory, and now he's the observing uh, chair committee sorry, the chair of the observing committee and administers the software training packages. I'm sure that if you, uh, if you are part of the Rascals discussion list, you will see him advertising those programs. He's crazy about double stars. And Blake, I've modified this to read slightly different than what you gave me I, because it just fit. He's so bananas about double stars that he has split over 1,700 pairs. And in the summer of 2022, Good to win. He, worked at, he worked at the Killarney Provincial Park Observatory in an association with York, with the York University Allen Cars, Carswell Observatory. He was the first astronomer in residence. So with no further ado, I give you Blake Nancaro. Welcome, Blake. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Are you certifiable? You know, I, I wonder about a few of us in the RASC. <laughs> um, I, I think some of you know the Big Bang uh, theory TV show. I love the line by Sheldon. One time he said, I'm not crazy. My mama had me tested. So, <laughs> so again, I raised the question, are you certifiable? And obviously, I'm talking about our RASC visual observing programs. And the answer to that is yes. Now, I'm coming to you from my city of St. Thomas. I'd like to recognize my lo local indigenous groups, which includes the Wyandat, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe the Atawandaronk, the Mississauga, and I, I'm just so honored to be able to share the land underneath my feet and the skies uh, above my head with these these peoples. I all to let you know that I'm uh, recovering from uh, minor back surgery, so I'm actually in my hospital bed, oddly. This is a, a weird way to present. Um, but I, I just wanted to point that out because I'm in an environment where it might suddenly get noisy and stuff like that if it gets really 
distracting. I'll pause or mute for a minute. I'm on their Wi-Fi, which I hope is pretty quick and fast, so I'm not too garbled or distorted. I can turn off my headshot if if it uh, will cut bandwidth and stuff like that. But um, you're fine, let me... Blake. Okay, so if audio cuts out or is garbled, I can repeat something. If just let me know. Uh, we we talked about this already. Um, so thank thanks for that in introduction. Um, I I also write for the the journal. You maybe see my software reviews there. I wrote for the former. Um, Sky News uh, as well. And I joined Rask London. I was sort of rogue or Ronin for about a year, but I'm ha happily now a member of my local center in London. And uh, Dale uh, is on the observing committee. He's in the London center. Um, so I had a, a familiar uh, to, to help me get settled there. The uh, I'm one of a team. I, I'm on the National Observing Committee, and I, I'm uh, honored to work with so many experienced and skilled and knowledgeable observers. There's about a dozen of us, and it's kind of coast to coast to coast, representing a lot of the centers throughout the country. And the together, we also hold some observing certificates. I have but one. You're local member Melody is our most decorated uh, uh, visual observer. She she has almost all the certificates. So together we have about 25, but it, that just represents a, a remarkable body of knowledge, uh, a deep, long uh, uh, experience, you know, sort of cycle, um, deep knowledge well, uh, so again, I'm I'm really pleased to work work with all of these people. I had joined uh, some some years before, and that was to sort of pave the way as I was building a new program, which I'll talk about a, a bit later. That's deployed now. Uh, but when Blair Stunder, my predecessor, stepped down, I blamed Dave Chapman. He tapped me, or voluntold me to become the the astronomy chair. So that started in the summer of 2021. And it should go without saying that we're all pretty passionate about vi visual astronomy. I, I don't want to spin that the wrong way. It's not like we're anti-photography. You know, it's not that sort of thing. But our program is about getting eyeballs to oculars. That's what we do. That's why we exist. That's why we have these observing programs. Now I can't see y'all, but but within the room, and and you can do it in your video display if your camera's on. You can react in some way. You can type something into the chat window, which I can sort of see. But I'm curious about you know what you're doing. Um, who who's completed a RASP certificate? For those of you in the room, stick your hand up and, and look around. Uh, so you, you can see there's there's a few people that have five, yeah, uh, achieved RAS certificates, and they're and I'm curious who's working on them. Put those hands up. Who's working on one right now or thinking about it? So there's maybe a few people chipping Four. away at uh, at some programs now, and that's fantastic. I always like to hear about people working on the programs, and people might be doing other things out technically outside of RASC. The, the big thing is our neighbors to the south, the Astronomical League has an extraordinary number of observing certificate programs, and many of our members have already completed those. Uh, again, lots of people are working on those. There might be other observing certificate programs in other countries. I'm not really aware of those. And I know within centers, they also have some specific uh, programs. Montreal has. Uh, a number of tremendous uh, uh, good observing programs, for example. So maybe people are pursuing those too. And again, I encourage that um, as much as possible. Go for it. There's there's lots of ways that you can obtain certificates for your observing accomplishments. But obviously my focus here today is on ours. Now, I, I thought I'd 
sort of have a look at the center, your your center. That's small print, I know, but you can see there's been a lot of certificates awarded in Halifax, and it goes back quite a ways. The Rask Observing Program started up in 1981, and it was a short time later, five years later, that the first one came in, and the second one looks like it was Dave Chapman. So. So lots of people right away started pursuing these observing programs. Initially, only the Messier, but you can see beginning in the mid-90s, the, the next program was launched, the finest new general catalog program, which is fantastic. I think it's a, a, a truly amazing uh, observing list. And, and, uh, and there's been pretty well continuous observing uh, or, or certificates awarded since that time from 86, no significant notable gaps. So people are active. I really like to see that, that there's been progress and work. It's gotten busy the last few years. So that that's pretty neat. The DSG on my slide there refers to the Deep Sky Gems. And that's a one of the more challenging programs. Melody has that certificate. It's one out of four across Canada. So that's that's pretty neat. And the Halifax Center can claim the you know first or early adoption of the our newest program, the Double Stars program. Again, that was accomplished by uh, Melody. So so a bit of name dropping there. You can pat your yourself all on the back or fist bump each other. Um, so keep it up. Great work, everyone. Um, so one of one of the more prolific uh, centers. Big picture here. There's, if you like graphs, there's all of the certificates awarded to date, and that's just from a couple of days ago. I took that snapshot, and, and you can see the green bars at the beginning are all the Messier programs, but now lately, all of our different programs. But the way I count it here is that we have nine observing certificates. There's Explore the Moon, which is kind of two variants there, um, the binoculars and the telescope, but nine total uh, programs there. And um, uh, you can see we had a huge year in 2021 due to, due to various sort of factors. But again, I'm very encouraged by how the programs are quite popular um, in recent years. So again, keep it up. Good work. Keep observing, keep looking up. And uh, we're happy to recognize that work and award those certificates. Now, th this is just me spinning the data a different way. If you look at the total number of certificates issued by a center, you, you're going to get a skewed result. If you got a big center like Toronto with lots of members, then you know, just more certificates issued in that, that, or from that center. So that's a, you know, in a way it's a bit of an aberration, but you can see you guys are number two. So right on, good, good job. Um, total in, in volume, uh, total volume number two across the country. So that's pretty neat. Now I take this data and just do a very rough crude calculation a different way to show kind of per capita, if that's the right way to say it, and that's sort of certificates by the number of members. Um, there's a freakish result with Sarnia just because they're a small center, but they have many certificates that uh, have been awarded. It's almost a one-to-one -one ratio, given their their small size. But but. Halifax comes in number six in that case. So again, it's very impressive to me what what is accomplished in your center. So um, you can be proud of that. So let me tell you about our, our various programs that are available from RASC. Any questions for me so far? Feel free to ask at any. I variety of we have really good sampler i think or a a really good sort of uh, uh, uh pathways for people with different experience levels 
with different equipment and so on. And again, our purpose, the observing committee exists to encourage observing. We want people looking through telescopes, getting the hairs on the back of their neck, standing up, getting that visceral experience. It, I know physically it's not photons from the galaxy going into our eye, but you can think of it that way, that these distant photons are going into our eye and, and we're perceiving them and experiencing that. And I, I, I love that feeling uh, myself when I see something so so far away and I start to think about it and 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 so on. So um, again, an eyeball and and some sort of magnification, be it binoculars or telescopes, that that's what we're encouraging. And and we're a big fan of logging. We we encourage that for a, a number of reasons. Uh, we do believe it makes a better observer and that it's a, a feedback loop. If you log well, you see better. If you see better, you log better and your whole experience gets better. You start to actually visually see things um, better. So we're, we're a big proponent of logging. Now, the logging in all of our programs is a requirement, if you will, in the sense that to to receive a certificate, we need to know what you saw. So you have to write it down or draw a picture of it or do both. And, and then, then we can have that visceral experience as if we're sitting beside you. When we review certificates and we're reading our log, your log notes, we're looking at your sketches, it draws us in. We, we can be in, in captured or enthralled by your story. I, I really enjoy reading people's observing notes. So we're encouraging that. Sketching is technically optional with our observing programs, but again, we advocate or encourage that. We have uh, programs, again, with lots of different targets and, and things like that. M me, personally, when I observe, if I don't have a checklist in front of me, I don't have a good evening because I'll... I'll I don't look at new things. I, I don't challenge myself. It, my whole life is like that. In many cases, I need a target. I need a goal. I need something to go after. I, I need an objective. So I love that about these, these programs. And I think if you're wired that way, it, it's really good. It gives you have a campaign. You have things that, that you can work at. And again, there's different sort of levels here. We're, we're in the business of give, giving goosebumps. <laughs> so ho hopefully we, we can do that for you. So here's a high level picture of you. Again, if you, you count the explore the moon twice, the binocular and the telescope version, we have eight, dif uh, nine, excuse me, different observing programs from RASC. And I've categorized them kind of in level here or or a challenge uh, level or difficulty so we've got some uh, e easy beginner starting out programs the uh, explore the universe is a fantastic uh, sampler getting people started and getting people familiar with a lot of different types of objects dave uh, dave chapman um should take a bow right now cuz he was key in deploying the explore the moon uh, programs so the, these are very very popular programs now we have intermediate level programs i'm going to go into these in a bit more detail uh shortly uh, but you can see we've got uh, uh three intermediate level programs so a bit more challenging bit bit more uh sort of demands in terms of equipment telescope needed in general for for those and then we have advanced or very advanced programs. Uh, by the way, on our website at uh, ras.ca, if you go into the observing section, you'll also see that we have some YouTube videos that are supporting a lot of what I'm talking about, sort of how to get started in a program and sort of roughly what to do and and how to do the logging and things like that. So, so browse around at some point on our website as you're getting interested in these programs. So let, let's do a bit of a deeper dive into each one of these. The Explore the Universe um, is a unique program 
in that it is open to all, everyone, all humans on planet Earth. Uh, one does not need to be a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada to uh, complete and submit the logging and receive a certificate and receive a pin for the Explore the Universe or EU program. Uh, a very nice thing about this program, again, is it's quite easy, truly in the sense that no special equipment is required. So many of these targets can be seen with just eyes. If you have good eyes or a good prescription, you can see a bunch of these objects um, right away and complete um, a, a log entry for those. Some of the targets, binoculars would be recommended um, for them. And many of these targets can be seen uh, anywhere. So it does not require a drive to a dark site location. Hey, so some of this can be done um, from home. Hopefully you don't have nasty uh, light pollution surrounding you, but you might be able to tag a few from a city balcony, from a condo, from downtown. So lots of work can be done in uh, even uh, light polluted locations. So that that's that's really nice. I like that. Um, it's a really good sampler. We we have galaxies, um, a galaxy or two. Uh, we have uh, open clusters, uh, double stars. We uh, get people looking at the moon, understanding the phases of the moon, the planets. And there's a lot of additional or extra um, items that can be observed as well, sort of bonus or a, uh, additional or slightly more challenging um, items. There's a total of 110, or or if you count some of the bonus targets, just over 110 targets. But the Explore the Universe does not require that all 110 have to be observed. The minimum for the certificate is 55. So that makes it easy to for people to get into this. Um, and and if people do a few extras, awesome. That's great. Um, we recognize if people do the whole 110, the whole enchilada. Uh, but um, yeah, easy to to get going with that with 55 targets minimum. Now, if you do have a telescope and it's a go-to telescope, you need to be careful here in that a requirement of the Explore the Universe program is that the objects need to be found manually or by traditional method or by star hopping. So some people ask me, oh, I have a go-to telescope. I guess I can't do this program. And I say, no, you, you can do the program. You can use whatever instrument you have, go for it, but just don't use the go-to function. Don't look up the target in the hand controller and flew to it. Maybe you just ignore the hand controller and manually move the telescope, find the object by the finder, and then look through the eyepiece. So it doesn't matter what equipment you have, but we do not want people using the go-to function to reach the target. What we're trying to do is getting people a bit familiar with the sky, learning basics of star, uh, star hopping, to reach the target. And, and I believe all of those are pretty easy to, to reach um, by classic means, by looking through the finder, getting in the right area and having a look through the eyepiece and you go, oh, there it is. So so that's good. There, there For all of our certificate programs, there's an application form. There is a unique one or a distinct one that we use for the Explore the Universe. It has obvious labeling and it's on the appropriate page and so on. But uh, you just use that specific form when you're completing the application. There's a lot of supporting paperwork and documentation for all of our programs. So, so if you look at the Explore the Universe page, sort of everything is there that you need. Lots of, lots of aids that you can use or you don't have to use. We even have log sheets that are pre sort of pre-printed, pre-designed. So, you, you can download a log sheet and use it and fill that out. We have, for many of our programs, we have a workbook too with additional instructions. So that's our first basic program there. Here's the Explore the Moon program. Again, really good for people starting out uh, because 
there's two programs here. There is a explore the moon using binoculars and an explore the moon using a telescope. Obviously that tells you what kind of equipment um, you need. So again, for people without a telescope right now, you can get a certificate um, exploring the moon. And there are 40 targets for you to find in your binoculars. Uh, so very, very easy to do. Um, my note at the bottom, I, I say that with some reservation. The, uh, uh, what I mean there is that if you had good weather through one lunar cycle, you could maybe observe all of your targets on a night by night basis and get it done pretty quickly. But I want to frame that in the sense that we do not award speed. <laughs> So don't rush. We don't we don't recognize that. We quite the opposite. We tell people to slow down. Often we sometimes we can tell people have gone through something very quickly and we go, whoa, whoa, slow down, enjoy the view, smell the roses, it, soak in those photons, take your time. So I just point it out because it it's possible that you could finish that fairly quickly if you had good conditions and and worked at it a few nights in a row. It the telescope. Uh, version has 94 targets and there's a uh, some additional bonus ones for fun with Canadian content um uh, so so two again two variants of this program obviously uh, sky conditions and location are not a factor as long as you don't have clouds you can do this work anytime anywhere um you might there there's an argument some people say, uh, putting binoculars on a tripod is good. I like steady views, certainly, um, there. But at the same time, binoculars are so movable. So it's so flexible to be able to move around and look at different stuff. But you might consider a tripod um, to make for a very steady view. Um, if you're going to sketch, obviously super handy if you get the binoculars on a tripod and then uh, can work away at your uh, your drawing at that stage. If you apply for the Explore the Moon binocular program, uh, we will send out a certificate um, for you. For people that complete the Explore the Moon telescope version, certificate is provided with the uh, attractive metal lapel pin. Okay, we're getting into our oldest program here, the Messier catalog program. And obviously this is based on the classic Messier, Charles Messier list with 110 targets. If you actually count all of the targets in the list proper, there's, uh, I show the plus there just because there's a few hybrid or combination objects um, there, but roughly 110 targets there. And this Light. can be, yes. There's a question. True, true. Oh, is it in the chat? No, it's it's me, Dave Chapman. Okay, Dave, yeah. Hi, Blake, thanks. For, Hi. Thanks for coming. Uh, Hi. Before I yeah. make my comment, I'm going to make another comment. <laughs> I, I do appreciate that you did step in when Blair suddenly stepped mm. out. And uh, I had just finished doing it, so I didn't want to come back. Uh, to meet him. <laughs> but honestly, when I looked around at who we had, and uh, you know, I knew you a, a bit, and uh, you were, you were uh, to me, uh, uh, the best candidate to take that job. and. Uh, uh, and I think it's worked out really well. I really appreciate how you've taken charge of things. Thanks, man. The other comment I wanted to make is about the Explore the Moon. You mentioned that I had a lot to do with it. Um, Patrice uh, Scadlin and I cooked it up, and I also had discussions with uh, um, Ted Dunphy mm. uh, in around 2012. And... Uh, it seemed like there was a gap between explore the universe, yeah. and the, the, the moon part of that, and the Isabel Williamson Lunar Observing Program, which was quite formidable. Right. And so we kind of came up with this idea of having a, a, a program where people could, um, basically the idea was it was, uh, with for people with telescopes particularly, it was a way to learn how to use your telescope and manipulate your telescope, find things, focus, all of those things with something that was easy to find. Uh -huh. uh, 
and and so that's why we, we sort of concentrated on that. Plus, it was a nice bridge from Explore the Universe to Isabel Williamson. And as I was kind of working on that, I got a phone call from Melody Hamilton, who you've mentioned as our most uh, certified observer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this was when she was starting out, and she said, Dave, I've been looking at the Isabel Williamson uh, uh, Explore the Moon uh, Isabel Williamson Lunar Observing Program. She said, "I just I can't make head nor tail of it. It's just too mm -hmm. much. It's it's." She just found it too intimidating. And I said, "Well, you know, there's an approach to doing it." I said, "But I've got this thing here that he might mm -hmm. be interested in," and so I sent it to her, and she was the first person before it was an official program. She was the first person to go through it, and and we gave a we gave a a center certificate to the people that finished it here. In a beta test form. She was the first one, one to complete that. Nice. So I always call her the um, the poster girl, as it were, for <laughs> because she was, she, you know, she came to me and I said, "Well, try this out," and she just finished it with flying colors and and mm -hmm. moved on from there. So I just wanted to kind of communicate that story back to you about her involvement in that and other people in the center too. Yeah. And then we brought it to the RASC. So, all right, thanks. Great words. Um, also, I want to acknowledge Patrice's wife. I'm drawing a blank. I'm very sorry, Andrea. Um, she worked on the graphics for the Explore the Moon program. A and back to Melody, she did a very similar thing for me with the Double Stars program, kind of a beta tester. So, so yeah, thanks again to Melody. Um, she's been obviously very involved with these in different ways as a consumer, but also helping in the design and the development. So that's great, thanks. So I was talking about the Messier, did I get everything there? Um, so obviously these targets, Messier targets can be, um, more challenging in terms of the sky that you need. So very likely for some of these targets, you're if you're in the city, you're gonna gotta you're gonna need to get out of your bright bright light pollution or light dome. A couple of the targets for people that are familiar with the Messier, some of them like Messier seventy four, super duper hard. Uh, so you may need dark skies, but. But in theory, uh, not a huge instrument um, should be doable, maybe in a three and six inch telescope, all of these. Some people observed all Messier objects with binoculars. So think about what Galileo, you know, and some of the early, uh, or sorry, Charles, Charles uh, Messier had in terms of equipment. They weren't huge telescopes like we may have access to now. Um, if you've got your 10 inch dob, go for it. Um, but but um, not crazy demands in terms of equipment. Uh, for all of our programs in general, um, the Explore the Universe notwithstanding, mm -hmm. you, you can kind of use whatever you have. That, that's my take on this, but do acknowledge that or, or record it, um, or it will in many cases be apparent in your logging, but um we we acknowledge or recognize how you do your observing so do you want to do it by traditional means by star hopping and so on then make make that decision and go for that and don't use the go-to functions of your equipment if you if you want or were prefer to have the telescope itself or an attached computer or a smartphone uh, driving it and slew to your targets so be it Ignore, record that in your notes fine we still award the certificate we just kind of want to know how you did it um we we've got a real mix of people old school new and so on so um old, old timers will say oh you got to learn the sky and got to do it by manual method but but in some cases that that's not really practical or easy for people and the go-to solutions are going to make it more enjoyable and easier for people we want happy observers uh, so 
So, uh, but just, just note the method that you use for doing that. And you can show that easily on the application form as you apply. I love the finest NGC program that it, it, these are incredible objects uh, that in, in some cases are as interesting or more spectacular than the Messier targets. Uh, in deference to the Messier program, 110 objects, uh, similar in that, uh, you know, a modest size telescope um, can be used. Some of these are objects that you'll need to get into a dark sky site um, for them. And upon completion of that program, uh, once again, a, a certificate and a metal pin for that. These images, by the way, that, that you're seeing are uh, uh, graphic renderings, but that's what the pin would uh, look like, not actual size. Here's our newest program. Uh, Blake? This, yes. Just to go back to the NGCs, sure. can we assume that the 110 plus that are on the NGC list are not replicated on the um, SA list? That is correct. Yeah. So this is a completely distinct list uh, developed by Alan Dyer. Um, and these were objects that he found very interesting. And, and you know, one sort of take on it, it is, how how did Messier not see these objects? You know, sometimes they're right beside something like the Leo triplet, you know, the hamburger galaxy is right there. How did Messier not see it or record it? Um, but yeah, it's a completely separate list, no overlap um, with that. So 110 brand new objects for it. Uh, this is uh, Dave Lane. Uh, I did the finest NGC shortly after I did the Messier list back in the early 90s, I think. Yeah, uh, and I, one of the, anyone who's done that list learns to swear at a particular object. <laughs> I see, I see two eighty nine, uh, and you know afterwards I spoke to Alan at one of the GAs about that object, and and he intentionally threw a few really hard ones in there just to challenge you. So while they were not, they aren't all uniform brightness, and there probably are other yeah. other other galaxies or other objects that are that are not in the Messier and are are brighter, but he felt it that it was a good idea to throw in a few that were really quite difficult. Yeah. Uh, that that one, and I believe there's a galaxy low in down below crater that's also quite difficult for us Canadians at, at our latitude. Yeah. Yeah. And, and another neat thing is size too. There there's the whole range of sizes. We've got planetary nebulas, super small, you know, blue snowball for example, and then massive objects like the Veil or the, the North American Nebula. Uh, so very interesting in terms of dimensional size as well, huge variety. Um, and again, a, a fantastic objects, ga galaxies, clusters, um, uh, diffuse stuff, uh, big, small, really nice. I. I actually was so inspired by this. I used the list uh, for a photographic campaign. And thanks to Dave Lane, I, I was able to image all of the finest NGCs with the Burke Gaffney Observatory. So that it, it made for a, a wonderful target list again. That's me needing targets. Uh, I photograph them. I'm not applying. <laughs> For the finest NGC certificate in my photographic campaign, but I just like the list so much. Um, it just fantastic objects again, and I have observed almost all of them visually as well, and really enjoyed the again that that visceral immediate view. So a couple of years ago, a brand new program was launched, our Double Stars program, and this is a bit like what Dave was saying a few moments ago that this was something that I found or I encountered. I saw that there was a gap that it seemed like within RASC, there wasn't a lot of interest, that's not the right way to say it, or attention about double stars. And I, I thought this is weird. Yes, we have double star lists in the observer's handbook. It's in the handbook. Uh, so there are a couple there and they're, they're great. Uh, but I, it just oddly in various sort of ways, I thought there's a bit of a gap here and I thought, let's, 
let's do something about that. And then, and, you know, clearly, um, uh, when you look at the Astronomical League, you know, they're, they're big fans of that. They're, they have a number of double star observing certificate programs. So we built one uh, aimed at the intermediate observatory and uh, uh, people that like star hopping and stuff. Once again, 110 targets. What that means is that there's 110 pairs of stars that are required to be observed for the certificate. If you're familiar with double stars, you know they don't come only in pairs. We get triples, we get quads, and so on. So there's there's actually a kind of extra uh, stars or companions to these pairs that you could observe depending on your instrumentation and how good your seeing conditions are and things like that. So there's an opportunity to record a great number of extra stars like a, a A and a B and a C and a D for a particular target. That's not required. We have the 110 minimum, but for people that spot or want to try more, they can. We have an extra guide that talks about all of the possible stars that you might see given the magnitude range of a modest, small telescope. Something I like about this program is you get to use all of your eyepieces, the old dusty ones that you hardly ever use. You, you know, those department store telescopes that say, you can go to 600 power. And we always tell people, uh, don't do that. <laughs> you know, that's not the right way to use your telescope. But an interesting thing about double stars is sometimes you got to do that. You go to crazy high powers in some cases if the sky can handle it. So sometimes I've worked at 400, 500 power, way out there. So you get to use all your eyepieces. You start with your lowest, and then you work your way up um, with, with the doubles. My favorite part, though, about the Double Stars program is you can do it anywhere, anytime, even if the moon's out. So you can do it in your driveway. You can do it in the backyard. Um, you can do it if all the street lights are on and not covered with garbage bags. So, so uh, uh, that's just because we're talking about a point source, you know, a thin beam of light, photons punching through light pollution. That's kind of cool. Now, good, good seeing stable air is very nice to have uh, for some of these targets that are close or or uh, disparate in terms of their brightness, but. Um, I don't sit around and wait for good seeing. I observe and I just record or document what the seeing is. And if the seeing looks good, I'll try more challenging things. If I look at something and it's all mushy, I go, okay, well, I'll leave that for later. I'll observe it tomorrow or I'll try again next weekend. A certificate and PIN is awarded. We just launched the PIN recently for that. So uh, once again, a nice, attractive metal pin. So it's, this is our brand new program for people that have done some of the programs already and you're looking for something new or unique and you've never really sort of looked at double stars. I hope you try it. I, I think they're really, really interesting targets. Um, I'm very biased. <laughs> so Dave was talking about that gap that the Isabel Williamson Lunar Observing Program has been around for quite some time but it is challenging. You can see by the numbers right away. There are 260 required targets. This gets you working at a very deep level on the moon. You're really concentrating on particular regions, staying on them for a while, not looking at just one crater, but say multiple features around a crater or in a mare looking at the, the particular, the geographic features of that mare or a mountain range and what's going on near that mountain range and so on. So lots of targets, 260 required with 170 um, challenge targets. There's actually a an additional level to this where there's a total of 1,000 possible targets. So that can also, you can see or could imagine it would represent a, a considerable amount of time to, to do this. Again, there's no time expectations with any of our observing programs. It took me 20 years, 25 years to get my, my, from my first to my last messy AI object um, there. So no, you know, take your time um, here, but there's quite a challenging program. Uh, 
some of these objects, you also have to wait for the right libration. You need the moon tilted the right way to get something that's right at the edge um, of the moon. So you might get clouded out that night. You got to wait another lunar cycle um, for that. Not any special demands in terms of equipment. Anytime observing the moon, you might benefit from a neutral density filter, but no, not required. Um, for that. And again, once again, look, work anywhere. Our last challenging, we have, again, you can see there's a lot of, there's 150. It's, I've just started myself. I've with these, but I'm starting from new observations. Um, here, brand new logbook. For uh, a medium to large aperture telescope will be needed for um, this program to complete it. And dark skies are going to be needed in some cases. I'm able to do a few from my my light polluted balcony, but uh, for many of these, I'll have to get out to a dark sky site um, to do that. Upon completion, certificate awarded um, for that. This is based on the list that's in the uh, observer's handbook. Um, so you can see what you're uh, up against. Um, there and there's a sketch on the right of what what somebody saw three three little needle galaxies um, there. So nice program for people who are looking for a more challenging. They're looking for something beyond the Messiers, beyond the finest NGCs. And then we have Deep Sky Challenge, and you might go, oh, that's easy. There's only four to five targets, <laughs> but some of these are really really tough. And uh, I don't have my notes in front of me, but I believe there's a quasar in that list as well. Um, so, so you're you're looking way back in time with this uh, particular program. And once again, um, a medium to a large telescope, dark sky is definitely needed for a number of these objects. There's a number of very faint, diffuse uh, targets here, and then certificate awarded upon completion. Uh, to see what you're up against. Again, look in the observer's handbook um, for that challenge list. So that that's all of our programs, uh, our nine different observing programs, again, in including the two uh, ETM, binocular and telescope uh, versions there. So how, how am I doing for time? Um, about another 10 minutes. Okay. Let me do something really quickly here for people that are quite new um, to this idea of observing and uh, making a log book and having it checked out and getting getting certified. So I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, sort of how to observe. And, and this is from our point of view, sort of what we are hoping that, that uh, an observer will do as they go through a campaign and what we expect as the observing committee, what we want to see or receive from the observer to help us out, to know that you saw the objects that we were hoping that you would see. So I'll go through this uh, quickly here. So how to observe what, you know, the question is, what do I do? What am I supposed to do? I'm actively helping some people with this that are new to certain programs, sort of trying to describe what you could expect to see looking through the eyepiece, what you can expect to see to get, or how do you get to the object and so on. So we have lots of information in our web pages. So this is a good resource. If you're, if you're going to begin a campaign, strongly recommend you read everything that we have on our website. Also don't uh, overlook the handbook, uh, Paul Markov's article in the handbook on uh, how to, uh, prepare and make your observe, uh, observing logbook. That's a great article. So be sure to read read that. Lots of good information there. Now we have a little acronym that we sort of use or encourage people to think about, L-E-R. And that stands for locate, um, examine, and then record. So I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Um, I'm speaking very generally for this bit, but obviously... Each observing program has very specific things. Like if you're looking at a planet versus looking at a galaxy, you're going to observe a different way or look for different things. So take that with a grain of salt, obviously. Um, 
I talked about this before that that um, we we strongly believe that uh, if you log, it helps you pull out details from an observation as you're looking at something. And then when you look again at something, you're starting to see it better because you're thinking about the things to look for. So you get this neat feedback loop. Log better, you'll see better. Log better, see better. Um, it's worked for me, for sure, that that my, it's weird. It's a perception thing. It's It's nothing physically changed with me, but I can see deeper. I can see fainter magnitudes. Uh, I can see more detail. And it's because I trained my eye. I've just trained my brain to do this. And logging is a big thing that helped me for that. We we want to see a brief description and or an annotated sketch. So you can write a brief note of what you saw. You can do a picture with some notes on the picture or do a combo. Um, Again, sketching is not required. Some people are put off by that. And I'm I try to sketch more. I'm I'm sort of lazy. I often don't do it, but I try. So so words or a picture or both. And that that's what we like to see. And that helps us again know that you saw the object um, in, in question. And uh, logs also serve as a, a memory aid going back. That to me is really important. Going back through my old log notes, what did I see before? And so I, all kinds of bad. I'll stop harping about the, the logs, but they're important, obviously, uh, that we receive something from you so that we know what you saw on the eyepiece. Locating objects. Uh, this is the L part of that acronym. There's a variety of techniques, obviously, that you can use. We, I've shown you that, except for the Explore the Universe program, you can use any equipment or instrumentation that you have, including a go-to scope. Uh, just record the method that, that you're using. Um, but uh, star hop at, as uh, needed um, or use the go-to function as needed. When I first heard about star hopping, I thought, how do people do this? I can't do that. It's a black art, but now I don't think twice about it. And I now I, I'm very grateful that I've learned that skill. And I actually do a deeper, finer level field hopping, if that's right, where I'll use a go-to scope. It'll go to the object, but it's off. So I'm staring at my chart and going back and forth and figuring out where I am. And often I have to move a bit and go, oh, now I'm in the right area. So I'm so glad I know how to do that, do field identification. And that's really at its core sort of just uh, identifying patterns and things like that. Mike, um, yes. Uh, there's a question in the chat. It says, is there a short course on how to keep a log or is that covered in the program? Is there a short course on how to log? No, actually. No, but that's a neat idea. Yeah, talking. Yeah, we could talk about logging techniques and stuff. I've uh, been in um, sessions where we've talked about sketching techniques and stuff like that. So that's a intriguing idea to talk about logging techniques and styles and stuff like that. So I'll put a pin in that. Thanks. Uh, I, I use lots of different methods myself. I've used classic paper charts. You can see that's a screen snapshot from the pocket sky atlas. Um, so I, I've used uh, classic paper charts and then identified the field and got to my objects by, by that means. I'm I'm a computer geek, so I regularly use that. That's why I have an asterisk here besides software. Again, you may want to apply for a certificate using the traditional method of star hopping. That's great. That does not mean you can't be using a computer for your charting. So I do that. I use electronic charts. It's just the charts electronic as opposed to paper, but I'm still star hopping to get to my quarry. Uh, so again, Lots of ways to locate things and so on. I remind you that we we encourage starting with low magnification, especially with double stars. Um, start with your lowest power eyepiece um, and then work up uh, as needed. Examining, this is, this is a big important part. And I think uh, I have a tendency to rush. I think sometimes people sort of rush and don't dwell here. But the spirit of this is look at, 
in the eyepiece and wait and soak it in. Um, averted vision, that's a whole other thing. That's something else that you could almost do a course on. I, I did a lot of um, uh, uh, performance skill training. I learned about uh, um, soft focus and sport vision and stuff like this. So I think that um, this is uh, very underrated here, but I often, when I look through the eyepiece, I'm moving my eye around, scanning, I'm trying to relax. Uh, I'm trying to absorb as much as I can um, on, on that object. Uh, again, dwell. Now, this is where we get into specific programs. If you're looking at a galaxy, coax out those faint details. If you're looking at the moon, what are the geographic features that you're seeing around your quarry? If you're looking at a double star, relax, settle, dwell on it a bit. Do you get color? Star, stars aren't white. Um, or some are, but but invariably there's a touch of color um, to any star that you look at and you get two beside each other and usually the colors will stand out. It's not like colors you see in the flower bed. They can be very subtle, but I, I love looking at for that. I try to coax out those colors from those double stars. One's a very, very pale yellow and the other one might have a hint of blue or a hint of red in it and so on. And up and down the eyepieces, when I look at double star, the colors might change or shift. Um, when they're close together, you often get more pronounced color, I think, because it just, our brain can compare them more easily. So low power again, to, to get the extract those difficult colors. So specific programs look for, you know, be, be aware of the kinds of things that we're uh, asking you to look for. Um, for for those and again work with all your eyepieces and then record what you see now th this might put people off right away here's a very very detailed note um, here very extensive notes and that's not to say you have to do that and again there's a sketch some people go oh i don't want to sketch objects i don't know how to sketch um here so th this is sort of one uh, example of a log page. This one's specifically for the double stars. So you can see there's very pointed questions. And we ask about things like, what, what was your initial impression of the system? Did it look like one star? Did it look like two right away? And then, then if you see the two, what, what kind of colors could, could you pull out? What, what kind of angle or orientation were they to one another? And, and you can use a simple thing is just use clock face. Oh, it's at, I regularly do that. Oh, it's at the four o'clock position um, for, for a double star. Uh, and you can see we've asked you about other things, equipment, magnification, obviously date and time, uh, sky conditions, and so on. Each program is different here. So you're just seeing the, the double star one um, right now. So just document what what you can. I'm a, I, I'm a note taker, a list taker. I love recording a lot of stuff. And I even got things about you know, noises that I hear nigh, nearby, the people that visit me, what what I'm imbibing at that particular moment. <laughs> so, um, so record what you can, but it can be very minimal uh, as well. He, here's a snapshot of a logbook from the Explore the Moon um, program. So you can see little sketches here of a crater and some of the, the neighbors. So, Nice, simple sketches there, short little brief note. And again, some particulars of the evening and the sky and things like that. Don't like sketching, not comfortable with it. Just write down your words. That That's okay. So that's what we're looking for, for recording um, there. Some brief words, um, maybe a sketch, maybe both. Um, so I hope I hope that helps give you a sense of what what we're encouraging you to do. And again, the important thing is we're we're trying to uh, understand what you saw. We, we're trying to have the experience of us being sitting beside you while you're at the telescope. So you, you're helping us out as we review your application. There's appropriate forms on the website. You download the appropriate form. You uh, This is an example of the Explore the Universe um, one specifically. In, in general, the uh, all the other certificates uh, require uh, two uh, authentications, two witnesses. 
um, to that. Um, I won't get into all the particulars of this, but in general, uh, uh, certificates can be reviewed at a variety of different levels or places. So if you have people within your center, Halifax obviously does, um, reviewing can happen locally. Some centers don't have that or aren't comfortable with that. So applications can come straight into the observing committee and, and we'll do it. So anybody can do it, any sort of anywhere on the ladder, um, the, the review process can happen. Uh, lo log books need to be reviewed. Um, we're trying to discourage sending huge files through email. So we encourage people to use sharing services. If you have Google Drive or iCloud or something like that, that's easy. We RASC has an uploader service if if you don't have anything like that. So we can easily share files, not not through email, um, to to review work. Uh, so the application process, we we can help you through all those steps um, for that. And, and then uh, when your work is reviewed and we like what we see, we celebrate that accomplishment. And we do that lots of different ways. Obviously, I've talked about providing the observer, the certificate, and in some cases, a PIN for that. And we also list people's names on our website um, in short order. So if you look at the observing committee, uh, the visual observing certificate pages, you'll see lots of people's names there. Uh, and we note it in the bulletin. It goes into our, our annual report and so on. I kind of fell off the wagon. I haven't been doing social media posts um, for, for that, but we, we recognize you uh, in, in a variety of different channels. I've given you lots of information. I could go on for hours, obviously, but rask.ca obviously is where everything is warehoused. And the simple thing to do is just go go click on the observing um, link in the main menu, and that'll take you into the specific program pages. You can see they're all listed here down my snapshot on the left, the, the eight different main uh, programs. We have some, this is the general information page with some good information there. We also have a, a page called Observing Tips, Tips and Expectations. Uh, I really strongly recommend that to people who are starting out doing their first program. Look at that. There's lots of good advice there to help uh, give you a sense of what we're looking for, what, what we expect the observer um, to do. So ho hopefully all that information, that's a lot. If you like reading stuff, there's a lot of information there. That's that's good. If you don't like reading a lot of stuff, um, that that's maybe a bit uh, uh, intimidating, but do do what you need to do to get familiar with the, uh, the program. Just a couple of little random thoughts here. Um, uh, I've said it at the beginning and the end here. I had an idea a little while ago um, and I just wanted to get the word out. If you're taking your first steps with an observing program to get certified uh, and, and you're wondering, am I doing it right? So, contact me, send in a sample log page to me. We do one log page by email, send that into me, send a couple of pages and we'll look at them. And we can give you some pointer. If you're heading in a funny direction, we'll go, oh, instead of doing that, let's do this. Um, but it's let's do spot checks at the beginning to make sure it'd be a shame if you got down at the end of a list of 110 things and there was something you forgot that you didn't know you were supposed to do. So let's make sure those things don't happen. Let's get you on the right the right path right at, right at the beginning. So don't hesitate. I have an open door. Contact me anytime about any sort of thing like that. It, we're trying hard to make all of our information consistent and clear. We've got some work to do, but but uh, if there's anything ambiguous or confusing, ask me. Oh, I'm happy to help there. Uh, I wanted to clarify something about observing together. If, say, there's a family um, and they... Um, a couple of people want to get observing certificates together. That's great. Um, working together is fantastic. It can be really fun. But we uh, re know that an observing certificate application is for an individual effort. So what we mean by that is that each person has their own logbook. They're doing their own entries in that. Each person is finding the objects on their own. Each people is uh, uh, examining the objects on their own. They're writing their own log notes. 
So do what you need to do as you work together to accomplish that, to, to have your own separate, unique, personal body of work. Another big thing that we are often asked about is what about photography? So hopefully I can explain this as clearly as possible. The bottom line is the really simple rule, if you will, is that the, our visual observing certificate programs are about you looking through a telescope with your eye and it's what you see up in the sky with your eye. Some people have asked if they can use their telescope, take a photo of the object and then base their observation on the photo. No, not that. We, we don't want the camera in between your recorded observation and, and that object. Uh, can photos be included in your logs? Yes. Um, so you can observe the object, experience it, write down that visceral experience, what you've seen with your eye, and then you can include a photo. That this is where I've observed and I saw these features while I was looking through the telescope. Does that make sense? You, you can have photos in your log book, but we don't want your observation based on a photo. It, your observation needs to be based on uh, an ocular view, an eyepiece view, and your eyeball. I hope it does. Again, we're not anti-photography department. <laughs> if you're familiar, is in charge of the astro imaging certificate. So if you do want to get certified there, um, go check out that department. Stuart's in charge of the photography certificates. Um, and uh, we we work together. Um, we're uh, we're uh, familiar with each other's work there. So that, but again, that's a, it's not my department. <laughs> so thanks. Um, keep looking up, keep observing, obviously, and you can get certified. So I hope this has been informative. There, there's lots, lots more information we could get into, but I think we have, RASC has fun and interesting programs. Again, we're working hard to make them better and we're dynamic. Uh, we, uh, we're considering other observing projects and campaigns. So we, the double stars was the latest edition. And in the future, there'll be maybe some new uh, observing programs, new types of targets and so on. We're always considering that. We have a lot of ideas in the hopper. Building an observing program is a significant undertaking. So so nothing imminent is uh, coming at this stage, but but we have there's lots of interesting things we're thinking about. So you know, keep an eye out. There might be some new programs coming soon. And if you have suggestions, send them in. We'll entertain those ideas. So keep on observing. Um, keep logging. I'm biased. I'm a big big fan of logging. And again, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me at any time or anybody on the observing committee. Your local rep again is Melody. I want to acknowledge or recognize the, the different resources and tools and people that helped me out um, for for photographs in this presentation and and other support and so on. So thank you to all of those uh, resources there, and, and thank you for your time and attention. I really appreciate it. Again, rask.ca, your observing section for all, all information about our observing programs. But if there's something that's not clear or obvious, or you have a very particular question, do not hesitate to send an email um, to, to me. Um, the observing at ras.ca will reach me directly in moments. So I, I think that's it. Um, that's all I have there. Thanks so, so much. Th yeah, thank you. Sure. Thanks for coming today. Uh, even if you are in your hospital bed, I <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for for your time. Um, and I know, I, I think most of us can appreciate, Blake, that uh, these programs, as you said, and as Dave has intimated here, they aren't something that are developed overnight. They do take the mm -hmm. uh, passion and the um, 
willingness to work on these programs for a while to get them to the point where we can actually use them as RASC members. Uh, they are, I think RASC, thanks to people like yourself and your committee over the years, uh, can be very proud of what they've done in terms of the programs, and they are being recognized internationally, I understand, so kudos. Mm. Uh, any questions for Blake before uh, we close this particular session? Right, well, thanks again, Blake. Um, get well soon, and uh, we'll be mm -hmm. in touch, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, you bet. Thanks again. Okay, um, next up on our program is Dave Huskin for the What's Up in May. That rather lends itself rather well because if you know what's up in May, you can work towards one of these objects in one of those programs that you're getting, uh, want to be certified in. So I'll hand it over to Dave. Okay, so um, what's up? We're, this is actually a little late in the month um, for this, <laughs> for various reasons. Uh, fortunately, though, a lot of what I'll um, try to highlight is the, towards the end of the month, so we haven't missed an awful lot. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, we're coming to the end of galaxy season. I, um, I was asked, well, but I could still see galaxies. Um, absolutely. I mean, there's lots of galaxies you can see all all year round, um, but uh, people refer to galaxy season because uh, uh, March in particular is when Virgo is high in the sky and there's lots of uh, galaxies to see in the Virgo supercluster. And, and this is a picture of uh, Markarian's chain, which is an, a, a famous uh, chain of galaxies um, in Virgo. Okay, this thing's set. All right. <laughs> uh, sun this month. Uh, hey, um, no mystery. Days are getting longer. Um, so uh, you probably noticed at the start of the month, uh, it, we hear the birds pretty early in the morning. Uh, so uh, dawn started May 1st, uh, just after 4. Um, uh, by the end of the month, it'll be just after 3, uh, sunrise actually taking place at uh, 5.32 at the end of the month. And uh, sunset uh, taking place into the month uh, a few minutes before, uh, before 9, um, but dusk only uh, ending at 11. So um, if you're an imager, uh, nights are short. <laughs> We've got four, four hours of, of, of real dark, darkness. The sun. Um, what's it looking like today? Lots of uh, sunspot groups visible. Um, the bigger uh, AR3296, which is the one that was responsible for a number of uh, M class flares, is rotating out of view. Um, the uh, groups that are coming into view are pretty stable, uh, so unlikely to have. Uh, have the flares associated with them, but apparently there's a really big sunspot on the other side of the sun that will rotate into view next week. So that, that might be interesting. Um, on the right, uh, this is just some uh, statistics that I uh, thought was kind of interesting. Um, it, this picture and the stats are from spaceweather.com. Uh, um, in 2023, there have been zero days where there have been no sunspots visible. Uh, from the Earth. Um, and in 2022, there was only one day. Uh, so that tells you we're, we're moving into solar maximum. Uh, compare that to uh, 2019, where there were 281 days where there were no sunspots. So, and but if you go back to the last solar maximum, um, uh, you know, well, look between 2011 to uh, you know, 2015. Um, sun was very active 
in those four years in terms of uh, sunspot. So 2024-2025 would be good. Uh, the moon this month. Um, frogs croaking uh, full moon was on May 5th. Uh, the Ada Aquarius uh, meteor shower peak was on the 7th. Uh, so past the uh, last quarter of the 12th uh, would have been last night or, or seen it early this morning. Um, May 17th, that's the uh, next uh, need event. Um, if you're an early riser, you can see the uh, moon uh, close to Jupiter, a very thin um, waning uh, crescent moon. Um, Here's what you can see in your 15 by 70 uh, binoculars uh, just before sunrise on the 17th. So worth getting up early, I think. Um, new moon is May 19th. That's the tree's fully leaf moon. Um, and then the next two events are on the 23rd and 24th of May, where the moon is near Venus and Mars. And May 27th is last quarter. Uh, May 23rd, uh, this is a, a nice wide angle uh, photo op. Um, you see in uh, just uh, after sunset, uh, Gemini's uh, fairly low in the sky uh, with Venus right in the middle of it. Uh, nice crescent moon, um, also in Gemini, and then Mars uh, moving towards Cancer. So quite uh, lots of nice bright objects, bright stars to to capture. And on the 24th, a little later, around 10, um, notice uh, again a crescent moon and Mars in Cancer. Um, and uh, if you have a, a DSLR with an APS-C uh, sensor and a, a 100 millimeter focal length lens, um, that's what you'll you'll see on the lower lower part of the screen. You can catch uh, Mars and the B cluster and the crescent moon all in one frame. Uh, the best uh, time to uh, knock off a, a few of the uh, uh, lunar um, targets for uh, explore the universe or uh, explore the moon is. Uh, between May 26th and the 28th, when the uh, Terminator is, is uh, near the center, so just before and just after last quarter. Um, so the first quarter, if you're a um, keener, uh, you can also uh, look at last quarter moon, but you have to get it early in the morning. Planets in May. Um, Mercury is visible um, by the middle of this month, uh, just before dawn. It's uh, dimmer than it has been. Uh, the maximum western elongation will be 25 degrees on the 29th. Venus is still brilliant in the sky and uh, will um, be visible um, up until midnight for much of the month. Uh, the ninth, its maximum northerly declination is 26 degrees. And the 23rd, as I said, it's near the uh, waxing crescent moon. Uh, Mars, uh, dimmer than it was at uh, its closest approach, but still uh, pretty obvious as a, as a uh, nice red point of light. Uh, and the uh, 23rd and the 31st or the days when uh, Mars is uh, either near a crescent moon or near the uh, EFA cluster. Uh, Jupiter uh, is a morning object by the second week of May. Uh, later on in the month, there's a series of double shadow transits. And if you look in the observer's handbook, that will. Oh, oh it's filter cleaning. What does that mean? <laughs> oh, the projector actually shut itself off.
short intermission while the projector cleans its filters. I think they should so they don't burn the bulb out. <laughs> <laughs> so we're on the timer. <laughs> Yeah, that would that would do it. So it's sunny. <laughs> I don't think skies are going to be clear tonight. I just checked uh, astrospheric, and I think around between ten and eleven, the skies will be pretty decent. Uh, but uh, not long enough to uh, do any serious uh, imaging, but certainly long enough to do a, a bit of observing. There we are. Okay, we're back. Uh, so Jupiter, I looked for it in the morning. Uh, Saturn, also looked for it in the morning in Aquarius. Um, Uranus is too close to the sun uh, this month to be visible. Uh, and uh, Neptune can be found low in the east uh, bef just before dawn. So this is uh, what you'll see uh, if you uh, use your binoculars, your 15 by 70s on May 31st. This is a beautiful view. So uh, Mars uh, almost in the middle of the, uh, or, or on the edges rather, of the Beehive Cluster in Gemini. So fingers crossed we'll get a, a nice uh, clear sky. There you go, even nicer. <laughs> So uh, Blair just said uh, the next day, if you have a telescope, have a look, and it'll be Mars will be in the Beehive Cluster, right in the middle of it. Uh, spring constellations. Uh, what uh, should you be looking for in Explore the Universe? Uh, well, uh, Ursa Minor, Ursa Major, high in the sky, pretty easy to find. Uh, Bote's another one that's easy to find. Uh, just look at the uh, bright. Uh, uh, red orange star Arcturus, and uh, the uh, trick then is is if you follow the arc of the uh, handle, the Big Dipper, that points down towards uh, Arcturus. Uh, Leo in Vir and Virgo um, are getting pretty uh, low in the uh, in the uh, southwest, uh, so soon to be gone, and uh, Libra is climbing. Uh, in the southeast. Spring stars, um, ranking in, in uh, relative brightness, uh, Arcturus is uh, number three, so pretty easy to find. Um, two stars in Ursa Major, uh, Dupe and Merrick. Uh, two stars in Ursa Minor, uh, Polaris and Kochab. Uh, Kochab is is fairly uh, fairly bright. Um, Regulus and uh, Denebola in uh, Leo, uh, Spica in Virgo, and in Libra, uh, the two uh, tongue twister stars, which I'm not going to pronounce. Z stars. Dave Chapman can pronounce them properly. <laughs> there you. <laughs> uh, deep sky object, uh, Messier 5, um, is the one to uh, look for and explore the universe. Uh, it's uh, just at the, uh, I don't know if it's actually in Virgo, but it, it's close to, um, to Virgo. Uh, it's an ancient, uh, densely uh, populated uh, globular cluster, and it's actually in, in Serpent. And you can see it with binoculars. Uh, it's pretty spectacular in a, in a small telescope, too. Uh, double star uh, target for Explore the Universe. Uh, this is an easy one. Uh, have a, try to catch this one before Leo disappears. Um, Atafera or Zeta Leonis. 
and 35 leonis. Uh, this is an optical double, so they're they're um, actually not uh, gravitationally linked, uh, but they appear uh, to be a, to be a double. Uh, they're pretty easy to find, um, and uh, you should be able to split them easily in, in binoculars. Uh, they're 174 light years from each other, so obviously not not gravitationally paired. And an optional solar system observation in Explore the Universe are, is the uh, one of the um, dwarf uh, planets, Ceres. And uh, you can see Ceres uh, in Leo, uh, well, a couple nights ago, uh, which you wouldn't have because of the smoke in the sky. <laughs> but uh, it's still going to be close, close, to, uh, close to Leo. Uh, and so if you have um, Valerium or, or um, one of the other uh, applications, you can uh, track it down and see if you can uh, find it in your telescope. And that's it for May. So fingers crossed we get some clear skies <laughs> with no smoke. Any questions? Thanks, Dave. Uh, are there any questions for David at all before we go on? OK. The last person to speak to us today is Pat Kelly. Uh, he is our vice president, and he will be talking to us about what the board is up to these days. So, board notes. Pat, are you out there? Oh, yes, and I didn't even have to ask to have uh, screen sharing turned on. Somebody's somebody's uh, well ahead of me. We're getting okay. better at this. So, I thought, uh, to keep this thing a bit more interesting, I would try and do what they did in faulty towers and come with different anagrams for the title of it. So for this month, it's notes for the board. You said notes from the board. And uh, first thing up is governance, which is usually uh, what tends to put people to sleep. But we, we've approved a lot of things at the, at the board level recently, uh, mostly updates to policies and a few new ones. Uh, so we've updated the astral imaging contest Basically, the main changes are there's now a minimum of six photos needed per category for that category to actually proceed to judging. Uh, you, some of you may recall that this year, this past year, uh, we didn't have enough submissions and we weren't really sure exactly where we should draw the line. So we, uh, we checked with the people involved in the contest and six photos per category seems to be fine. And we also set the actual deadline for submissions to a fixed date each year rather than the way it was sort of vaguely worded in the uh, in the past, which was sort of around the end of the year-ish bit. Uh, the next one up, and I know Transport Canada does not put a hyphen between the green and the laser, but the fact they don't understand how a compound adjective works doesn't keep me from doing it. Um, so we have a new policy which basically governs laser pointers when it comes to uh, standard outreach events. In a nutshell, uh, you have to have two people for these events, one to use the laser pointer and one to look for airplanes. Apparently the person who actually has the laser pointer can't do both, so you need two people. They both have to be trained. Uh, we're gonna be providing uh, some, up, some more training sessions. Uh, we, uh, a, a number of people already had the training session from the National Society, but once somebody has been trained, they can therefore have the background needed to go through the presentation to train others, you'll be certified for three years and we're gonna keep track of that internally as to whether or not uh, when people need to have their, their, their things updated and refreshed. Uh, we also did some things uh, on policies on ordinary committees. Uh, basically for the nominating committee, we sort of clarified the procedures into a step-by-step -step thing uh, to match what was actually happening. And the other main changes is all the committees now have a set date for when the chair is appointed and a later set date for appointment of the members. Whereas before it was, uh, again, it was sort of uh, a bit on the vague side. And we also approved a new uh, position description, uh, number 10 for the webmaster. That's a new one that basically defines uh, the role of the webmaster uh, and what they're responsible for. 
We had looked at putting in one for the past president, but decided at this point uh, we did not need to have a past president on the board. So uh, that we sort of did the work on it, but uh, didn't get around to actually uh, approving it. In terms of uh, upcoming deadlines, there's only one, uh, and that is the submissions deadline for the next issue of Nova Notes. It's June the 7th, uh, 17th, and um, well, it doesn't really show up very well. I, I put part of the text in bold face because when I first threw that up on the screen, the Nova Notes editor part of it looked like a really long uh, scrabble hand, and it wasn't obvious what it actually said. Uh, so it's Nova Notes Editor at halifax.resc.ca. So if you have any pictures, any stories, any uh, interesting observations, uh, send them in by June 17th and they'll get into the next edition. Next up are center stars. So uh, this is where uh, people that are in the center uh, are noticed outside of the center for things and they're in no particular order. They're in the order in which I generally tend to get around to, to add them to the presentation. Uh, so the first up is Kathy Walker. She had a picture in the upcoming June 2023 issue of Sky and Telescope. And this is the image. It's NGC 5634. So it's the globular cl cluster right, right at the very center. And the reason uh, why her picture was selected is they were doing an article on distant globular clusters. And this one is about as distant as they get. Uh, you can see it's in a fairly sparse uh, field of stars, and that's because it has a galactic latitude of plus 50 degrees. So it's more than halfway from the plane of the galaxy to the galactic North Pole. So there's really no dust or anything else to block the view of it. And it's also quite distant. The center of the galaxy is about eight kiloparsecs away. That's 25 kiloparsecs away. So it's basically three times farther from us than this galactic center is. So it's way over on the very far side uh, of the Milky Way compared to where we are. And that image is represents about two and a half hours uh, of imaging. So she took uh, at least a dozen images in each of red, green, and blue and, uh, and luminance. So four components for, uh, for, to make the image. And they were each uh, 120 seconds, so two minutes. And a bit longer than that for the luminance ones. So really nice image, and it's uh, it's always uh, nice when uh, uh, when you take an image of something that can be used uh, to help other people learn about some of the neat objects up there. Next center star is Jason Dain. He was interviewed on Global TV uh, after we had that really amazing display of Aurora images. Um, this is just one of his images, and he was actually in several places recently, and. Uh, for those of you who may not have seen his global TV presentation, he is going to be uh, the main speaker at this year's Nova East Star Party, talking about his sort of travels, especially into Scandinavia, to take pictures of the Northern Lights. And there's a picture of Jason Dane, a photographer, he's a videographer and all sorts of things. Uh, and for those of you who aren't aware, he's also a very keen birder. Uh, so he's... Uh, He's, he's not just good at photographing the nighttime sky. He's really good at photographing birds as well. The third one up is in the print this time, Jason Dane and Tiffany Fields, who's the technician at St. Mary's Observatory. Uh, they had an article in Saltwire, also known as the Chronicle Herald, or whatever it's, whatever it's currently called in the print edition, again, about the Aurora display. And this is a... Uh, uh, the lead story from the website version of it. And it's basically a sort of a two-part article with uh, Tiffany Fields talking about the reason why we saw the auroras and then Jason talking about how you photograph them. And that's another one of, of his images. Actually, I think, don't tell me, is that the same as, I should pop back out and go back in again. And just hang on a second here. is I just picked um, a random shot from the ones they were showing on that website and I did not notice it. I grabbed the same image uh, that was, the, the, the Herald took one of the same images that was in the global T news one 
there was a sequence of about 12 of these going by and I just did a screen grab of one of them and it just occurred to me now that, uh, okay, I got the same one twice. Now well, stranger things have happened. So that's the, uh, that's the center stars. Upcoming events, we have one more members meeting before the break for the summer, that's on June the 3rd. The RESC's National Annual General Meeting is being held on June the 25th, and you can register for that online. And note that this year, the GA, which has already come and gone, the GA and the AGM are not on the same dates this year. And the first meeting coming back in the fall is on September the 9th, which is not the usual second Saturday or the first Saturday of the month because that's the Labor Day weekend. So it's been bumped back one week. And the other three main events that we have coming up for the summer is the 2023 Ketchum Kujik Dark Sky Weekend. That's the nights of August 11th to 13th. And oddly enough, it's being held at Ketchum Kujik National Park. And the next weekend is the Nova East Star Party held at Smiley's Provincial Park uh, near Windsor. And that's the nights of August 18th to 20th. And the new moon you'll notice is on the 16th. So it's, it's right in between those two weekends. So they're gonna have really nice dark skies for the dark sky weekend, which is why they have it when there's no moon to, to cause problems. Uh, but generally for Nova East, it's nice to have a, a nice thin crescent moon in the sky for doing public observing to show people, because everybody likes looking at crescent moons. They're just one of those things. And then the last thing is uh, in the fall is our, our, our annual barbecue at the St. Croix Observatory. And it's gonna be on Friday, September the 15th. And the rain date for that is September the 16th. Um, if there's a hurricane that weekend, uh, it'll then be to be determined. Um, And that's it for things that the board has been up to. Thanks, Pat. Any questions for Pat regarding any of that? Okay, thanks so much. Well, that concludes today's program. I'd like to thank everyone for attending, those of you here at uh, St. Mary's University, as well as those of you out there in Zoom land. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not thank St. Mary's University as well for providing this space to us on a, for numerous years now. Um, thanks to our speakers, both Blair McDonald here locally, as well as to Blake uh, from London Center for attending today and providing such incredible talks to us as per usual. We'll see you again in three, uh, only three weeks time, uh, June 3rd. Uh, so, we will have an exciting program there as well for you to uh, come and enjoy. Happy Mother's Day to those of the female uh, gender that are observers like myself and to those of you who are male, please thank your mothers, otherwise you would not be here. Uh, in the meantime, starting at your feet, look up. The skies are open most nights lately, thankfully. Um, stay well, stay healthy, and we'll see you June 3rd. Thank you.